Thank you, Madam Clerk. So today we're going to get an update of ARPA allocations. And this legislation was passed about a year ago. Um, time flies. And so we're be, we will be hearing for, uh, five pieces today. And today is just really to get an update, get the metrics, um, the goals, and hear the challenges. So first up, I am um, happy to call Build Environment Director Rose and Chris Nance. Shout out to Patrice from GCP here. <laughs> Hello, Councilwoman. How are you? Okay. So this um, legislation number is 672-2023, build environment for $10 million. Um, hi, Director. Hello, nice How to see you? you. Yeah, it's been a while. So I am going to turn it over to you. Great, thank you Chairwoman Santana and hello to members of the council, nice to see you. It's been a little while since I've been at the table so really happy and excited to provide you this update. I'm joined by Chris Nance from the Greater Cleveland Partnership. I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes just updating you. Uh, well, reminding you first on what this legislation was. Uh, the councilwoman mentioned that we passed it first around a year ago, but then again with more specific allocation amounts last summer. We spent a lot of that time building um, the, the infrastructure and connective tissue between all our, our grantee partners and really getting ourselves organized. So I'm gonna walk you through that. And director, really quick, I just want my colleagues to know that I did pass out a list of partners. Oh, great. Okay, with the amounts great. allocated. Yes. They'll, they'll also be in the presentation, which I'd be happy to email to you after today. So $10 million for workforce development to build the pipeline and diversify the pipeline of workers in five categories of jobs that we define broadly as built environment. That's construction as we typically think of it, both residential and commercial, infrastructure, transit, and water, broadband deployment, climate action, and remediation. So that's really broad. Um, but these categories were created because we know that there are big investments happening and coming to Cleveland, and we need our workforce to be as ready as possible to make these projects a reality. So the $10 million, I think of it broken down into these five categories. Engaging more residents to go into the relevant workforce training programs, supporting them through that trainee training process, training them with the skills they need to succeed across those five uh, categories you see at the top, obviously ultimately employing them so they can earn wages. And then um, there's a fifth and important piece of this that's a little bit different, which is developing the ownership of firms uh, to also bid and compete on this work and hire from this workforce pool we're creating. That is the work that Chris will talk about in a few minutes. These are the key outcomes that we committed to when we came before you to pass this legislation last year. These metrics will be met by the end of 2026. So we're looking about a, a three and a half year grant period here, and we're really just at the beginning of the first of the three full years. We're gonna enroll 3,000 people at least um, over the three and a half years. And they must be at least 65% black Clevelanders, 13% Hispanic or Latino Clevelanders, and 30% women. We think this will convert to around 800 grant impacted placements or employment in relevant industries. And another key part of this project, again, is the partnership with MBEs and FBEs that our collaboration will engage, expand, and connect to projects. Director. Oh, sure. Uh, just going back. How do you come up with those numbers? Sure. So 65 and 13 uh, we chose because they're consistent with the enrollment demographics in Cleveland Public Schools. And then 30% women was chosen, not because it's uh, consistent with the population, obviously, but because uh, right now 3% of construction workers are women. So that would represent a tenfold increase in the number of women in construction and related trades. Um, which would be a huge improvement, but obviously that number is so low that going from three to 50 didn't really feel achievable. Got it. Councilman Jones. M Madam Chairwoman, just for clarification, um, you said the 
uh, 13 percent. Is that you're you're basing it off the Cleveland schools population right now? Currently? Yes, the enrollment at the time we we selected those. I see. So right now, currently, you're you're saying that 65 percent of the students in and CMSD are, are African American. Yes, as a, at the time that we pulled those numbers, yeah, well, about a year ago. And everything else is other. I I think so. Yeah. Okay. And uh, just a reminder, too, that the 3,000 enrollments must be Cleveland residents. That's something we talked about at the table last year. This is for Cleveland residents. Here are our collaborative partners. So when we came back to you in July, we had more specificity on how this funding was going to break down. It's the sheet in front of you. These are the partners we cultivated and that came forward as the best partners for this work. Most of these partners you see are doing training. Some are doing the MBE assistance that Chris is going to talk about, and some are doing outreach. Uh, Ohio Means Jobs, or the Workforce Development Board, is serving as the hub and coordinator of a lot of this work. So these are the contracts that uh, for each partner, and it also together we have formed the Built Environment Collaborative for ongoing uh, coordination. So. Like I said, it's been about six months since we've been here, and I'm really excited to share with you some of the progress we've made. The contracts are in place. Uh, I want to thank both the council and the city staff for making that true. As you saw on the last page, that's a lot of contracts to get executed. So each one has outcomes tied to it, as well as a, a dollar amount tied to it. So that was no small feat, and it really was the first step to really getting going and enrolling residents in the training program. Then, as I mentioned, we formed the Built Environment Collaborative and organized ourselves. And that's important because uh, we created shared values, we created operating norms um, with the ultimate you know, shared goals. Uh, it also took a lot of time, it took a lot of time to design the processes, how we would collect data, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but um, you know, that was uh, very important work. And one of the things that the councilman I know you'll ask is sort of what's been challenging about this. That part was challenging. It was hard to get ourselves set up, but I really believe that we did it in the right way and that will pay off in the, in the years to come for this grant. And most excitingly, programming is online and residents are enrolling into these training programs. Some of them are getting placed into employment already as well, but right now our focus is on enrollment and connecting people to these services stay in training, to succeed in training, and then ultimately to succeed in employment. It looks different for every person. It costs differently for every person. And right now, our system has a one-size-fits-all approach to that. The trainee fund is much more flexible and generous in terms of what kind of wraparound supports we can provide for those 3,000 enrollees into training. So if someone tells us they need a car repair in order to get to work, if someone tells us they need more help to have their child enrolled in child care, Care. If someone needs better access to health services, those are all things that we can fund with this training. So it really is testing the idea of if we're really removing barriers for people, what does that look like for their training and their employment prospects? And community engagement is underway. And I want to start by thanking many members of council for participating in that with us. Our partners are out there. They are. Uh, doing everything to get uh, people enrolled into this program, working with a lot of you, holding events and job fairs, knocking on doors, attending community events, and soon we will launch our marketing strategy, which will include branded collateral as well. I'll talk a little bit more about how we can continue to work with council to make that true. So I mentioned uh, just for a moment, the collaborative has worked together to establish shared values. And like I said, it took a little bit of time, but it was work worth doing because the ongoing work of this collaborative will only succeed if we hang together over the life of the grant. I think oftentimes in workforce and in general, we see people receive a grant, go back, and spend the money the way they always have. This is really a different project in that this collaborative and these partners will continue to work together and problem solve challenges with this program over the life of the grant. And we hope to add even more partners over time as well. These are the committees and how we organize ourselves, setting up uh, at the outset data and referral processes, working on marketing and employer engagement, and then of course setting, as I mentioned, the parameters for the trainee fund. 
this is the process map that I mentioned, and it's the beginning of the marketing collateral that we'll use just about how a resident would experience this program. They'd be recruited in, they'd enroll, that critical wraparound services and supports piece, they'd complete training, they'd be placed in employment, and then ideally they would stay in that relevant employment or uh, either at one project or various projects over time. Councilman Jones, thank you for co-hosting. I didn't realize when I put this up how close you would be to your own photo when I presented it. Uh, Mind you. <laughs> this is a community event that our team held um, in Councilman Jones's ward with ULA, HHW, and some of our other partners to share what we're doing with the community and ideally get residents engaged in uh, the training. This is the ACE Mentor Programs Day that they hold across a variety of schools where they match uh, employers and mentors in these trades with students who are interested. And then um, this is for the upcoming work that Chris is gonna do. So this is really Chris's slide and we're gonna take a break from the workforce part and talk a little bit about the MBE and FBE development which in total is around one million of this $10 million. Hello, Chris. Uh, to the chair, to all of the council members, uh, this is not my slide, this is our slide. Yeah. And, and I think that the photograph, uh, uh, a number of you might recognize the photograph, that was the, that was the day that we, uh, uh, or rather the event, you know, signifying the passing of the community benefit ordinance. And I think that's a, a really significant, and Michelle, thank you, we did, we did not coordinate this, but it, it works beautifully. Um, because the work to connect uh, MBEs and WEBs to the construction sector is work that's been going on for a number of years. It actually uh, started 10 years ago uh, when uh, the GCP, uh, uh, the Jackson administration, as well as uh, project owners and others uh, established the Community Benefit Agreement, uh, the Memorandum of Understanding for Community Benefit Agreements in 2013. Uh, interestingly enough, right, while in 2023, 10 years later, uh, the Community Benefit Ordinance has passed uh, with um, a number of key requirements, and I also wanted to shout out, Michelle did the shout out on um, the uh, administrative and operational work behind getting all the contracts out to folks participating in the building. That's also true relative to accomplishing um, the community benefit ordinance. All of the, the research done by the, by the policy team uh, manifested itself not only in the five requirements for the community benefit ordinance, but there's a menu, as all of you know, of about 20 to 25 additional items that developers can use as a part of building projects. And I think that's really significant and um, it bears uh, emphasizing. So uh, the work of building and expanding uh, MBE businesses is work that uh, the GCP is doing in, part in close partnership with uh, both the Urban League and the Contractors Assistance Association. Uh, I know we have a lot of acronyms, but uh, CAA, and Glenn Shoemate, uh, of course, is the, the, uh, the minority uh, business development uh, strategy for CEA, the Construction Employers Administration. So this is uh, both a, um, this includes uh, connecting folks to union uh, job opportunities or business opportunities as well as those uh, that are not connected specifically to union labor. It's a both and approach. Uh, in addition to that CBO and getting the CBO passed uh, last year, that really positioned the, uh, it created that it, that additional incentive for our developers to partner with minority businesses, which is taking place, uh, which is taking place. Um, obviously, the administration is focused on uh, uh, promulgating the rules for the CBO, uh, but I do know a number of those uh, projects are moving forward, uh, benefiting from the guidance of the, of the CBO. Um, I've already mentioned the collaboration between the Urban League and CAA, uh, but that also, um, helping in the same way Michelle described um, the supportive services component of the built environment. Uh, think of when you're developing a business, you also need to have access to a whole set of supportive services. Instead of 
wraparound services, we describe those services in the business context as, as bonding, access to capital, um, being able to get access to, to contracts, uh, and professional services, something that I think has been underestimated, but we've built as a part of our strategy is to ensure that each of the MBEs that we work with has the necessary access and connection to professional services. Do they have an accountant? Do they have a banking relationship? Do they have a financial advisor? Um, you know, do they have you know, access to legal uh, services? Uh, for uh, an emerging business, uh, that is, those are critical. They may not be able to afford all of those services uniquely, uh, but we also are thinking about some creative ways uh, to create some pooled services uh, to support uh, the growth of minority businesses. And then lastly, and again, I look forward to any questions that you might have, um, the, the Building Cleveland Together, the CUBE Symposium, uh, a number of you uh, attended last year. Invitations have gone out, uh, went out to all of you, all of your administrative um, uh, uh, staff supports as well. Uh, it is a free event on Tuesday, uh, April the 9th. Uh, Councilman Starr, just want to hand you. This is the, uh, the flyer that you also have an electronic version of. Um, the focus of this event is from a, the audience. We'll have project owners. We'll have construction managers. We'll also, of course, have uh, female and minority-owned uh, business owners, as well as the resource organizations that specifically support uh, business development and expansion. Uh, the focus will not be folks talking at folks. Instead, it's going to be roundtable discussions, uh, along with some uh, panel uh, presentations, but more in direct response to the roundtable discussions. And then finally, uh, sharing strategies, ideas, and, and very direct conversation about what's working and what's not working. The last comment I wanted to share, I um, happened to return uh, from out of town this morning and, and I had a conversation uh, with a gentleman who works for the Department, of, uh, the Department of Transportation. And I described to him briefly um, our, uh, our efforts to pass the Community Benefit Ordinance, our efforts re that relate to the built environment work. And he said, Chris, he said, I'm so glad to hear that we have put so much emphasis and energy into moving these you know, major initiatives from the federal government, and we very seldom get the feedback from local communities around how it's actually working on the ground. He said, so that's a story he said to me that I hope you guys are telling more and more because that's, that's, the, uh, that's where the rubber meets the road. And with that, I'll yeah. turn the microphone back. Thank you, Chris. And a quick question for you, Chris. Um, yeah. Now that I'm in this space as the chair of workforce, I get to, a chance to talk to a lot of contractors. Yeah. How would you sum up the state of our contractors in the city of Cleveland? Well, it is, it's really, it's, it's a twofold, it's a twofold observation. We have about 15 to 20 what I'll call mature MBE and WBE firms that are able to respond to Bedrock and to Sherwin-Williams and to the clinic. And um, those firms are doing well. And there's no shortage of opportunity. The challenge is the next level of firms. One of the things I'm really excited about is that because we do have 15 to 20 mature MBE firms, uh, through our partnership, also through the built environment, we also have an agreement with uh, NAMAC, the National Association of Minority Contractors, established a Northeast Ohio chapter, and we're working with NAMAC to develop coaching and mentoring relationships with the pipeline MBE firms, right? And that will also include, um, you know, Aaron Kirkpatrick happens to be the president of, of NAMAC, uh, Keith Rogers and other legacy MBE owners are part of the NAMAC leadership. And so now we're in a position where we have legacy MBE firms mentoring other MBE firms, right? We still, of course, have mentoring relationships between majority-owned firms and, uh, and MBEs, but I think that's a new and encouraging kind of space that we're in, uh, that those firms are not only in a position to mentor, but uh, they've scaled to the point where they're 5, 10, 30, $40 million 
uh, companies that have the capacity uh, to really bring the next level of firms uh, uh, through that pipeline. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. On, on the point oh. extension, Madam Chair, yes, unless we're opening Jones. up for questions. Um, I don't think I have done. a few more slides. Okay. But I okay. That question, and thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I thought that was an excellent question. Mm -hmm. um, so, of the 15 um, um, minority firms, how many of those firms are African American? Probably all of them, except for one. Okay. And then next level, do we have a number on what that next level looks like? That's our work. So we don't That's have... our work. So we've invited uh, so far about 100 MBEs to the CUBE Symposium uh, taking place on April 9th, half-day session, City Club of Cleveland. Be there, be square. I'll be there. Um, and we are inviting those pipeline companies to that event. Many of them already have existing relationships with either some of our project owners or our more mature MBE firms. But the idea for that event is actually to do that next level of, of matchmaking, networking, and connecting. And as you look at the agenda for that event, uh, we actually have, uh, we've spaced the event so we can help to facilitate those connections. And again, the built environment is, is almost like a, a laboratory, right? All of these, there's a lot of activities going on, but the built environment, uh, the, the financial support through the built environment um, created this uh, kind of incubator where we're able to take some of our best ideas, some of our best practices, and accelerate them. Thank you. Thank you. Director. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I think you did a beautiful job of demonstrating that the purpose of your work is really growth and more opportunity for the MBEs you're working with, but in turn, as they grow, they will need more workers. And that's really why that this is part of this project instead of its own thing, because we want that to be a mutually beneficial relationship between the MBEs that are growing and the increased number of diverse workers we're preparing. So what have we done so far? Uh, in the time we've been up and running, which again was a little bit different timeline for each of our partners, all of them are enrolling people now. Some of them, you know, earlier this year, some of them late last year began enrolling using this funding and increased capacity. 241 enrollments into training. I'm really pleased with that. I know that though we're just getting started. Drawdown so far of 676,000. And again, $13,000 little more than that accessed from the trainee fund, that generous support of services. And you know, as Chris just mentioned, really is an incubator in and of itself as well. Director, what is your sure. overall? I know 241 is sure. a success, but what's your overall goal of enrollment? 3,000. Oh, 3, so at the beginning, that's oh, what we committed to, the 3,000 enrollments. Um, again, over the life of the grant through the end of 2026. So just so you don't have to get out your calculator, if we think of this grant as uh, 2024, 2025, and 2026, when the real work is gonna occur, we expect at least 83 enrollments per month. Um, so we're already exceeding that in the first <coughs> two months of this year. So I'm, I'm pleased with that pace, but I know it's about to hit a flywheel and really we're gonna be getting more and more people into this as word spreads, as we get our marketing up and running, um, and as people see the opportunities grow around them. So what's next? Uh, we hope to expand uh, training for lead certified contractors and, con and construction workforce there. That is an urgent need, as you all know well. We're also uh, undertaking a climate workforce opportunity analysis that is jointly funded and managed by the Cleveland Foundation and other local philanthropy uh, as it, and um, climate experts and workforce experts to make sure that we have a sense of what we need to be preparing for in the climate space and how that maps to construction skills. And then more, which is really just scaling the work that we're doing, continuing to enroll, continuing to train, continuing to place, just more and more of that as time goes on. I wanna share a quick success story. This is Quentin Forbes, and he enrolled in Cleveland Builds last year. He has given us permission to share his story, and I'm just gonna read it for you. Um, Quentin joined Cleveland Builds during a critical juncture in his life. As a single father, he had been struggling with an unsustainable wage while working for a laundry delivery service. He knew he needed a career change to provide a better life for himself and his newborn daughter. He knew he needed better pay and benefits. 
Despite relying on public transportation to attend class, Quinton's determination and drive never wavered. He shared his story with the Cleveland Build staff, and this only intensified their desire to get Q, as he's called, on a better path. Upon completing the Cleveland Builds program, he swiftly secured a position with the laborers local 310 and began working immediately. Thanks to the built environment trainee fund, we were able to pay down some fees that he would not have been able to afford otherwise. A driver's license reinstatement fee of $1,700 and union initiation fees of just over $600 covered by this funding. He now serves as a laborer with Precision Environmental on the Progressive Field Project, getting us ready for April 8th. Quentin saved up enough money to purchase a car and is well on his way to finding a more suitable living situation for himself and his infant daughter. So I want to thank you again for this funding, which enabled this opportunity for Quentin, to Quentin for sharing his story, and for Cleveland Builds for helping him on his journey. So this is the last slide, um, and I just want to again thank the council for your ongoing collaboration here. Uh, we've had a number of successful ward events. 11 uh, covering nine wards and nine members of council so far with more being planned all the time. Many of you have put these opportunities in your newsletters, which I hope you will continue to do and thank you. Um, tell employers and contractors about what we're doing here so that they can hire from our pool and get assistance from Chris's work. And uh, please invite me back for the next quarterly update, which I'll be happy to provide in June. Got it. Okay. You're done. That's it. I'm just going to leave this up on the screen. Um, it's one of the other one of the other programs funded through this. It is a Latino construction program. Um, I put it up in Spanish, uh, hoping that councilwoman will share it with her constituents. It begins today. Yeah. Good. I'll translate for you guys. <laughs> so um, thank you, director. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Director. Great work, and uh, Chris Nance, and, and your explanation. You did answer many of my que mm -hmm. questions through the um, your slide, but um, one of the things, now that this is a good segue, I did attend the Latino Construction graduation mm -hmm. um, last year, and I was telling, I, I was in tears. Yeah. And the members that graduated were in tears. And, but my question is, while well, that training was a success, and they had high participation, participation, what happens afterwards? How many of them were placed? How many of them are working now? Mm -hmm. And then that's one question. Second question is out of the 241 that you train, mm -hmm. how many of those employees have been placed? Yeah. Thank you, Councilwoman, Chairwoman, for the question. Uh, we don't have the outcomes of those 241 quite yet. Some of them probably are working now, but we haven't done our 90-day follow-up to see if they're placed and employed in uh, relevant employment yet. But we will, and by the time I'm here for the next quarter, we'll have more retrospective information. But yes, uh, employment or placement is the goal. It's the reason we're doing this. I'm not interested in just training people. All of workforce development is driven by demand, in this case, built environment or construction demand. And then we design training programs for it. What's good about this collaborative is the incumbency on that placement is on a number of people. It's on the Workforce Development Board and Ohio Means Jobs to ensure that there's case management for that person through placement and after. Um, it's incumbent on the employers to hire from this pool we are creating for them. And it is incumbent on the training providers themselves. All of the training providers that we're working with have strong employer relationships and employer preferences, which is fine. But it's all about creating those uh, pathways and even mini pathways for someone to leave training and quickly be employed. Got it. Thank you, Director. Chris, do you want to add? Yeah, just very, very, very quickly at that. Uh, at that uh, same at that same event, right? Oftentimes, these workforce programs graduate folks in isolation. You were at the event. The Cleveland Clinic was at the event. Gilbane Construction was at the event. Uh, Turner Construction was at the event, right? And so even as we uh, pull together where people specifically got connected, to me, that's a significant step forward, is that these events are no longer happening in 
as much isolation as they, as they did. Kind of the train and pray model is something that we needed to change, and I see that uh, beginning to shift now. Got it. Thank you, Chris. And this shameless plug, but you know, I've shared this with my colleagues. We're getting a lot of immigrants, newcomers. Mm -hmm. And every time I meet with, um, you know, meeting with a developer a project that's coming to our city, I feel like we don't have the capacity at this moment. So, which brings me to my last question. We learned the hard way about sustainability, right, with one-time allocations through ARPA dollars. How are you going to continue these projects? How are these organizations continue getting, you know, um, funding to continue their work? Because we need to move in alignment quickly for us to have the capacity for all these projects that are coming to the city of Cleveland. So. Sure. Um, so again, the 10 million is through the end of 2026, which in workforce is a pretty long runway, really three full years and, and then some of enrollment and program implementation. So I'm confident we're going to reach these outcomes through that time. A lot of what, though, we are building can live on, I don't want to say for free, but for lower costs. Some of this was about setting up the collaborative, its values, its processes. And that can be, can, will continue to live on for the current partners and future partners. Uh, I also think that this is one of those times where, at least for program management, the transition of the Workforce Development Board to a nonprofit will be able to fund the program management with those dollars in the future. So um, it's a great question about sustainability, but we've really been focused on getting this up and running for three years, so for the next three years. Chris, do you want any, nothing? Okay, so I'm gonna open it up um, to my colleagues. First up, I have Councilman Starr. Okay. Thank you, um, oh. Chairwoman, and thank you, Ms. Rose and Mr. Chris for coming to the committee with this update. Um, just, some, just some clarification on some things that I was looking at from this um, spreadsheet that we received. Um, out of this 10 million, based on what has been allocated for each item, line item, um, how much money has been spent already regarding the 10 million within this first year's time frame? Sure, so total all of the partners have drawn down around 676,000 as of the end of last week. Okay, that's all together, okay. Yeah, I do actually have a breakdown I can share with you by partner. Okay, that would be something great. Sure. And, um, to what I was looking at for, for the standpoint, for the ultimate goal is around 3,000 um, participants through the chair? Through the chair, yes, that's correct. Okay, and within that 3,000, you, you mentioned it was 241 that have participated already. Correct. Through the chair, correct. <laughs> okay, um, because I'm, I'm just looking at it from the lens. I know we, we got everything started, so 24 is the actual year to determine where we are at, and if we got 241 currently um, at the first quarter of that the first quarter of 2024, that's a high number. Um, I would definitely love to, to see how we can, this, this organization or this committee could possibly grab and put more hands on um, with the 241. And what I mean by that is, um, I had a chance when I was out in Atlanta and I spoke at a graduation, which was an IT um, cohort program called Per Scholars, yeah. and they do a lot of IT training, and they work with the youth. But one thing that I heard at the graduation that was profound was the fact that upon graduation, they had like a mentor for like a year straight. So during that job hiring process, during that getting into a placement, whether they graduate and went straight into the IT or they started doing something else, they still had the doors open for you know them to meet with a mentor who found out and kept up with them. Because when you say those 240, or not 241, or when you start thinking about these 241, but then you start thinking about the graduation that the chairwoman went to, okay, where are they at? Mm -hmm. What community do they live in? Um, 
what kind of support do they need? What kind of ways the council can support them? Um, because those play a long role in someone getting it. Because you can get that degree or you can get that certificate right. and you possibly never put it to use. Mind you, I, I got an MBA and I'm sitting there as a politician. So you, you want to make sure we align things to be able to help these individuals because we know the need is there. And I've had a wonderful opportunity to last, um, I think about a year and a half, working with Cordell Stokes uh, with different events in the community. But something oftentimes um, confused me is how do we keep, keep them in place? So my question to the chair would, if this been something that possibly with organizations such as a, um, Cleveland Bills to add that to their um, to-do list to yeah. be able to help with the placements. I know you mentioned 90 days. A lot happens in 90 days. Right. A lot happened in 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, having that hands on and what I learned from, make sure I say it per, per scholars. I said it right. I hope I, 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 hope I got right. it right. One of the things is, is they were able to do that, but then when they heard about the director um, and the different professors in their training, they also told them that, hey, you can come up any day still and utilize the services that they have with the program. So it was like an open door, and it also was a point where they have, with their mentors, already reoccurring meetings still scheduled. So things like that, I think that would be very important. Um, but then something I definitely would definitely like to look at is when you got ACE Mentor Program of Cleveland, um, when I see that it's a cost of $293,000, and it's saying the train exposed 450 students to a career place, um, careers, and then it says place 46 students in internships, um, and then it says place 16 college students into internships, and 10 place students into career placements. I would love to know where we are at with that because obviously I am a youth advocate. Yeah. So that is something I would like to understand. Like, do we have any data um, or numbers that could say what we have done within the last year regarding the ACE Mentor Program? Through the chairwoman to the councilman. Thank you for all of your questions and comments. I'll take them in order. Uh, so first of all, I recently also met with Perscolis when they were in town and was really impressed by their um, training program. I'll say that the idea of mentorship or ongoing coaching is a well-known um, best practice in workforce development, not just in tech, not just in construction, but anywhere. I'll tell you a little bit about how we've seen it working so far in this program, which is we have uh, a lot of enrollees moving into registered apprenticeship programs in the building trades. So that is, uh, by design, a program where they are earning and continuing to learn, and they have someone who is mentoring them. They don't necessarily call it mentoring, but that's what it is. It is ongoing, uh, on-the-job coaching. We also, uh, within the trainee fund, are funding a uh, model called Coach U, which is actually training for case managers. So across all of our partners, we are upskilling the case managers so that they can provide better case management during training and employment. And we're also partnering with United Way so that they know how to access 201's resources and database. So trying to connect systems that are working well. That's another innovation and incubator item. And we think that that's going to improve case management for our built environment participants, but also for every uh, employee or worker or trainee that these case managers come into contact with. So I'm really excited about that work. That is a form of ongoing mentoring. And typically in workforce, we measure uh, enrollment at, or I'm sorry, uh, employment at placement, and then at 30 and 90 days and at one year. And it has to be relevant employment. I, I am not interested in counting someone who goes through a construction training program and then ends up working in healthcare. That's great. Healthcare needs people too, but it has to be relevant employment in order for the training to be considered a success. Yeah, and, and to that point, that is, through the chairwoman, um, is very important because you want to make sure they have that employment. Definitely. But if it's, I went through a training and then I can't get a job in there, mm -hmm. so I explored another career, mm -hmm. 
then that means we have some things to work on. So um, that is something very important. But then when you talk about the ACE mentor program, do you have, a, do they have a relationship with the family support specialist where they can help with this 450? Because I believe, um, I believe in collaborations. And if you work together, we can hit that 450 within this, this um, three, two and a half year left um, time frame. So I definitely would love to see more information. But something that I also looked at um, where it says Cleveland Neighborhood Progress and it says B Workforce Initiative, um, there's $576,000 allocated to that program. And it said that they are going to use workforce coordinators to enroll um, into the B, I think, whatever, we come up with acronyms for everything. Yeah, the built uh, environment. Yeah. Built environment. Okay. Um, women, low, women, low income residents into workforce training programs throughout reach and recruitment strategies. Do we know what three CDCs are they working with? And um, if so, what does that look like? I think it. Thank you, uh, through the chair to the councilman. Yes, we do know the three. Um, I'm writing them down. I think this is right. I'll correct myself later if I'm not. It's Union Miles, Famicos, and Jefferson uh, West Park Piritas. Is that right? <laughs> and then th those are the three CDC service areas where we have a more intense focus but all CDCs and their staff are being empowered with information about enrolling into the collaborative. And then, and then to the chair, chairwoman, so what does the cost, um, estimated cost goes in through? I know they say I hire a coordinator or someone and some recruitment strategies, possible to training. I'm just trying to get to understand how do we reach those 900 residents across three CDs, mm -hmm. um, CDCs, and service areas of 100 residents outside of the CDC service areas. So that sounds like a thousand residents. Um, how do we do that at three CDCs? So as I mentioned, the three CDC service areas are where we will have the most intense outreach strategies. So basically full-time workforce organizers called workforce coordinators, but then every CDC is sharing information through their existing staff with residents about this programming. We heard that CDCs have a lot on their plates. We ask our government, our community asks them to promote a lot of things to residents. And so we ask them to share this with them, but in three areas we have a more intense focus on just built environment um, training partners. And we have a um, training directory that, that is shared of all of the training programs that they would share with residents to promote these opportunities. And, and through that, thank you for that, um, to the chair, Ms. Rose, for that. But sometimes I think, sometimes I think we be doing things like differently or the same way and don't get the different, the results we need. I mean, going to a community development corporation to be able to help people get jobs sound, such, sounds like social service. So when you think of social services, I would think of social service agencies. And I think the reason why CDCs got on, so much on their plates as opposed to doing the development that we, we made them out to be, and we could get into the history later, um, I think we're doing a disservice. And, and I'm afraid that we're gonna look up and those 1,000 residents are not going to get there because it's, it's a community development corporation trying to do social service. Community development corporation are not social service people. They may be able to um, help get the funding and s serve as a fiduciary or, 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 or be able to handle the finances or physical agents and stuff like that. But when it comes to getting into there, I, I'm not calling Burton Bill Carr to do the social service. I'm a call friendly in. I'm going to call a university settlement. I'm going to reach out to those individuals, those organizations, and say, hey, we're trying to get people these job opportunities. How can you connect with the residents on a whole other level? Because they're working with the, the community in that aspect. When we put that social service um, need with CDCs, that's when they get stretched out. 
and I'm, not, and I'm, I, I'm cautious. Obviously, Burtonville Car or, or Midtown or uh, Savick Village Development War 5 wasn't selected as a three, even though I have a large population of folks who are not working or they're working jobs that do not make that much money. I would love to be able to have that be an area of focus um, because we're trying to correct the right the wrongs of some things that have been done from the redlining and the things that has taken place to put us in this this area as far as the the demographics in War 5. So I definitely will put that as a point because I, I, I just don't know how a, a CDC, a community development corporation is going to get a thousand residents to enroll in the program. I, I, I have questions about CDCs all, all the time, about things that we've been trying to get from a council who allocates funding to these CDCs and they still don't get nothing because, you know, it's too much, or another CDC is telling them what they should do and not listen to counsel. And, and those things are, are, are real. And I'm, 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 Chairwoman, I know I'm about, I'm about, up, I'm about up on time, but I, um, yeah, I, I, I just, I just, and then I look at obviously Urban League. I want to see more so understanding of the seven hundred thousand dollars that they have to be able to create the, and then you see you got ACES, then you got them with 825 kids, and then we got 20, build 20 MBE contra contractors, and then I look at other things. I, I, I got a lot of questions on Chairwoman, but I know this is just a first quarter um, update. I'm just concerned a little bit, and just want to make sure I see, like we mentioned when we first allocate this, like, is this going to be 10 million? We're going to look up and we have the same problem. We don't have the capacity for the private sector because that's a huge need. Because obviously, when you're a union, the cost is uh, skyrocketed before them to do labor. So we're not able to get the rehabs we need in our homes because of not having that right the amount of um, private sector. So. I just, I just yelled, Chairwoman, and Thank I appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilman Starr. Very valid points, great questions. And I would say, um, in my experience in meeting with uh, director roles, you're very open to feedback. You've implemented a lot of the feedback that we've provided to you. So I would say, Councilman Starr, um, meet with you. For me, I would say my CDC, I, I don't think all the allocations should go there, but it's a piece, right? And every organization has their following of residents. So as many organizations could work together, I would say um, the better success. But I do agree on some of the worries that we have in, in alignment with, um, with your comments. But um, next up, I have Councilwoman Spencer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great comments from my colleague, Councilman Starr. That was important commentary. Thank you. I wanted to briefly, on the some of the comments that Councilman Starr was making through the chair, wanted just to inquire about the training directory. That sounds like something that perhaps members would, we're not, we're not workforce development experts, but I think the more that we know, the more mm -hmm. organically we can share that with our community members. So that might be a follow-up uh, for policy just to have, so yeah. we can see that evolving body of work and understand that resource ourselves. Yeah. Through, the chair. Through the chair to the councilman, thank you. Yes, this is, I have it with me. I'm happy to give you this copy. It lists all of the relevant funded training programs that one could be recruited into with a short description on which so that together um, coaches or case managers and residents can explore what might be right. So someone might react um, differently to the different options and find some to be a better fit. But we've got them all on here. We've got Urban Leagues Rebuild the Land. You know, this has information about the requirements and why it might be the best path for someone or it could be Wise Pathways, or it could be Building Futures. There's all sorts of options in here. I'm happy to give you my program directory. We are interested in getting this out into the hands of residents. 
the delay has been that we are also executing a marketing contract that is will be branded collateral and information for all the partners to use. Right now, the partners have been recruiting and enrolling on their own, and we hope to do it under the built environment umbrella once we have that stood up. That has been challenging, but this document is still good and it still works, um, but eventually it will be uh, more shareable and it will be more widely promoted. Great, and Madam Chair, I actually am going to keep my, my comments brief, but that was really the second piece I wanted to delve into. First, wanting to thank both the director and Mr. Nance for being here. I really appreciated learning more about the MBE, FBE development piece of this. It's extremely informative, thank you. I, though, want, with my question, really want to focus on uh, the individual worker journey or experience, which I think speaks to exactly what we were just touching upon. So to enroll in the collaborative, right, if we're, that's, that's kind of the, or to enroll in one of these programs, what is, what is that point of entry? How do, you, how do we, is it to the disparate partners? It sounds like it's moving in the direction of being a centralized intake. How will that work? Just because I think, again, for us being able to understand how to access, right? What is the entry point for a worker? And then similarly, once you're in, uh, who does the assessment about wh whether you would be eligible for the trainee fund mm -hmm. through the chair? Through the chair to the councilman, thank you, great questions. And I think we often think about these issues in the same way, which is what does the experience look like for a resident who, whose interest is peaked and, and what happens next? Right. So the entry point, uh, one of the things that's special about this project is the way the partners are working together as a collaborative instead of individually recruiting and really doing an assessment on the front end of which program in the directory might be most appropriate. So um, it's, it's now becoming increasingly common in the collaborative for towards employment to recruit someone in and refer them to Cleveland Builds or for um, Let's take another example, wise pathways to recruit someone in and send them to Tri-C. So there are lots of, um, we've created processes around how that works through a common intake. And uh, I want to go back to a point that Councilman Starr raised too, which is that CDCs are one way we are reaching residents to share the offerings with them. And, and, and doing the recruitment. But recruitment is a whole different step than enrollment. And that conversion from, a rec from recruitment to enrollment is the highest stakes, most important part of this to make sure we're not losing people once their interest is peaked and they learn more about the offering. So that is one thing that's special about this collaborative is the way that the partners are thinking differently about the way someone comes in and where might actually be the best fit for training for them instead of everyone just out there for their own finding whoever they can. And uh, that is, you know, this is uncommon in workforce and I'm really heartened about what we will learn from, from that process. So uh, they're making referrals amongst each other. If you enroll in a built environment funded training program, so the ones currently in that directory, you are eligible for the trainee fund. Uh, and then, Madam Chair, I'll just conclude with a comment, which is, if I understood correctly, there are 11 wards that have already had a built environment associated event, and I, for the record, wanted to say, <laughs> Ward 15 is ready, yes. let me know. When? So I, I believe uh, you are on the list of ones, uh, and this is outreach work that has been led by Cordell Stokes, who works at uh, Ohio Main Shops with us and has been leading these in-ward events. I know many of you have had them. They're very successful. They're fun. Um, I think he has reached out to your office, and I see a few others. But yes, our goal is to get to all 17 a few times over, over the course of this. So happy to work with you. We do all the work, you just put your face on the flyer and send it out to your residents. Great, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have to follow up on mine. Next up, I have Councilman Jones. Timer's on. Sometimes I think I've been at this table too long. <laughs> because sometimes you, it doesn't matter how you look at things, you just seems to get full circle sometimes. And I remember when Fannie Lewis used to sit here at this table. And she actually used to sit at that end. And she said, it doesn't matter 
how you shoot me. Whether you shot me on mistake or you shot me on purpose, I'm still dead. And I would ponder the, what she was saying, and then she would go into her point. And I want to move into my point on that same spirit. First of all, let me just thank the initiative and the effort. But we're still faced with the same issues that we have confronted for quite some time in this city. And that's having corporate community involvement. The city of Cleveland made available this $10 million. It was unprecedented. Uh, it has never happened that I can recall in my lifetime. And one of the things that when we talk about the use of ARPA funds and one-time spending, I'm more of a conservative person in that proposition. If we use that $10 million, for an example, we should also get corporate buy-in and leverage that with an additional $20 million. Now, the, the chairwoman asked a question about sustainability and how we sustain these programs. And we're six months down the line. We have a sheet here that gives us a general concept of who's going to be getting what to do whatever. And my question that I have, my first question is, do we have any corporate buy-in? Because what we're doing here is facilitating and assisting them to develop the workforce. Do we have any kind of buy-in from the workforce uh, as it relates to corporate community? Uh, is the state giving us any money? Is the county lending into this $10 million to leverage it? Director. Uh, through the chairwoman to the councilman. The $10 million is going to training, by and large, going to training providers. So to, we don't have no leverage. We're not leveraging that. We're not trying to multiply it for sustainability. Oh, well, it, it leverages several investments. Um, primarily, it leverages the work, the $20 million that comes to the work in Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act funds that comes to my organization every year. It's one of the reasons I thought the Workforce Development Board in Ohio, I mean, Jobs was best suited to lead on this because we are already daily working with thousands of job seekers per year to help them navigate career options, with this being another good one. So it's the program that you're, Madam Chairwoman, that you're already running. This helps to leverage your program that you already have, which is, you're saying, 20 million coming from the state for the region or for? From the federal government to the county. For, to the county. And do we have any corporate buy-in on this? Well, I would consider the Greater Cleveland Partnership, our corporate chamber of commerce, uh, being a key partner in this critical um, we will work with GCP through the critical work that Chris has described, but also through its employer members. Yeah, I, I think there's probably two levels to that, to the uh, through the chair, uh, to the councilman. Probably two levels of response. Your, your most specific question is, how many dollars will this 10 million leverage? So, Correct. Right, so we don't have the answer to that question today, right? Um, so that's that's the short that's the short answer. I think uh, next point on this first portion is when you look at the organizations that are at the table, who are coordinating efforts, who are sharing ideas, uh, who are actively engaged in saying now help me understand what you do. That's hard to quantify, but that's how systems change. Systems change by building relationships with people, by understanding how things work, and trying to build a better mousetrap. So we are in the process of building a better mousetrap. And as I mentioned earlier, in many ways, this built environment is an incubator. It is not the answer to all questions, right? But it has created, and that's I think the original intent of ARPA money, right, was to inject funds into local communities to be able to um, invest creatively and experiment with pilot programs. 
And I think that the way that, that this council has invested these funds with organizations that have been around, some new organizations. I, I, I think the combination of those two things creates the opportunity. Right. But lastly, uh, we very definitely uh, are in position to leverage additional dollars through these efforts. And I know that that's a part, that's been a it, part of our conversations. And uh, it's just a build it, we're still building kind of the infrastructure. I think we're past that point now. And Councilman, I think that as we move into the, the coming months in particular, uh, we'll be in a better position to say these are the, the specific it, dollars we've been able to leverage. It, it would be good. It would, and I don't want to cut you short because I don't because I don't want to have to come back on the back end. Um, but I just want to um, say, uh, Madam Chairwoman, you know, we were told that when we spent these ARPA funds, not only from the previous administration, but also from this administration, that we will work to leverage the funds, that we would get more sustainability. Um, because as we put this piece out, say it starts to really working in this last year, the third year of it, then the monies are gone, then the programs go out. And our neighborhood has seen that over and over and over and over and over. It's a, it's a repeat story in the African-American community. And so sitting here is one of the thoughts, and you know, I would hope, Madam Chairwoman, to the director, we could find some kind of leverage to uh, sustain these programs. And then the next piece is a glaring. It's like a big elephant in the room. And it, I'm, I'm reminded of then Mayor Mike White. Um, how, how do you let an elephant sneak up on you? It's a question to ponder for a moment. And that issue is communications. You know, how, how do we get the word out? There's 10 million here. And you have a number of organizations that are offering and providing a number of services. We're council members here. We have approved this $10 million. And I don't have nobody's phone number. Uh, on this sheet here. I don't have addresses. I don't have brochures. I don't even have like the fundamental write-ups of what the programs are going to provide, how they're going to be effective, where they're being marketed to, how I participate with you to be able to get that out. And so as citizens, we're sitting here and we've given you the $10 million. And so we would like to have some of the basics, communications, Having that information helps me to be able to deliver that to the citizens in my neighborhood so that they can access these programs. Um, and I know, and I don't want to be hard, I want you to think I'm difficult, but you know, the issue is, is that when we go out there to our citizens, they're going to ask us, hey, how did you spend that money? How did that benefit us? How did it come to our neighborhood? And I know I was on the one slide with my big bald head. And, and I was speaking to the folks. And I asked those people at that meeting, I'm not, I think you were not, were you, you were not there. It was uh, uh, Cordell Stokes was there. And I asked the, the people who were there in attendance trying to get jobs. And I said to them, you know, I asked them all who were trying to get jobs and they all raised their hands. And then I said to them, if you're looking for a job, and you want to really work, don't hesitate to give me a call. I had been in sessions like this before. And I told them, hey, I've been here before. And I told them to give me a call. I said, this is my personal cell phone. If you're looking for a job, you want to be employed, you're serious about being employed, give me a phone call. And I'll make sure I do my best to get you on a work site if you're in construction, I'll do my best to get you employment. And I told them not in the past, not one person when I put it out there has called me. And then I dared them. I said, and I double dare you. I triple dare you to just call me and let me do my best to help you. You know how many people are called out of that 50 some people, 60 people in attendance? Four. Four people called. And we helped them out. And we're still working on one that unfortunately hasn't been able to land a job. And I got an idea why, but we're working on them. And, and I say that because then the next question is, how do you measure success on these programs? Through the chairwoman to the councilman, uh, thank you for attending and, and 
co-hosting the event in your ward. I think you've maybe had two. I know a few of you have had two. Um, you don't have, though, to deliver workforce services. We have a whole organization that does that for you. So I hope that those 50 people are engaging at our center, Ohio Main Jobs at 1910 Carnegie, for career exploration. We can help someone find a job right there, or we can send someone into training, which is free to them with great supports. Uh, my cell phone is in my email signature. Anyone can call me there anytime. Um, I have twice invited you to our advisory committee for this work and provided an agenda and updates on how it's going. At the beginning of this conversation that we are just getting started, but I'm here because I would love nothing more than for council's help promoting this to your residents. I'll make sure you get the program directory, which is very thorough and any additional materials you might have to promote this in any way you can. And, and, and first, let me just, again, I, Ms. Rose, you know, I, I'm, I'm appreciative of the work. You know, it's really something else when you're, it seems like you're pulling all these different entities together and you're pulling it from scratch. So just note that I get it, I understand it. Um, would, again, getting that round around about partnership and having the corporate community in the city of Cleveland participate um, and having our financial institutions participate are important. We have a lot of, you know, business here, even some of those top level firms that you talk about, they should be putting in some money into this program. Th this is about helping them develop their workforce. This is about how we strengthen the city of Cleveland. This is about how we develop the relationships with CMSD. How do we have a, um, the ability and capacity as a city to be able to have a stable of young people from CMSD being able to be hired into these programs. And that was, this is something that I've been talking about day one since 2018. So it is my hope, Madam Chairwoman, and, and winding down, that, that we, we open the communications field. I look forward in seeing that uh, information, brochures, uh, who are the people running the programs, what are these addresses, because I want to engage them. And, um, and I, you know, good, I only have four people call me out of that 40, because maybe all the rest of them are happy. But at the end of the day, it is incumbent upon all of us to do everything we can to make sure that this city is sustained, it grows, and we can start bringing population back to the city of Cleveland. And one of the things that I see that are constantly happening in the work field and construction, they don't have enough workers. They don't have enough employees. It is probably uh, a real major issue for Cleveland. Uh, because everything I'm hearing right now from my friends and partners is that we're in trouble. So I don't know how we close the gap between the next three and ten years uh, if we get the kind of growth and development they're talking about here in the city of Cleveland. Um, how do we, we, can, we close that gap in terms of construction and development? Uh, that's it, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Councilman Jones. And I would say this Build Environment Workforce Development Program Directory, very thorough, it's great. Wish it was a little smaller, but you said you're working on it, but we will definitely make a copy because it has everyone's contact information and it has a description of each program. Yeah. So thank It's you not as that. pretty as it's going to be, but it's, it works. <laughs> it works, we have the contact so, information. So this would be the information that you were talking about I should get? Yes, okay. yep, okay. we got that. All right, thank you. So thank you, Director, for your time, um, GCP, Chris Nance. You guys are a great duel, by the way. I, I just so want to say <laughs> the tag teaming works with you guys. Yeah, good energy. So thank you for all your work with the City of Cleveland and your passion just around the workforce. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks so, for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Patrice. <laughs> um, so next up. Thank you for everyone staying within their 15 minutes. I really appreciate that. Um, so next up, we have the education um, ARPA legislation. And the, oh, Chief uh, Pomerantz here. I'm not sure, are you bringing everyone up? We have 52-2023 for Say Yes Family Support Specialists, which received 600,000. We have 91-2023, which is College Now Comeback 
um, back her campaign for 300,000. 93-2023 for GCCC PACE Education Pathways to Good Jobs. That's 2100000 And then last but not least, under your purview, is CMSD Integrated Health Initiative for $3.7 million. So, yes, Pesh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairperson. Um, what I think would be best is if we started with GCCC because Michelle Rose... The director also has some questions that may be coming up to help support that. So if you don't mind, um, I, don't I would uh, just bring up one group at a time. Will that work? Yep, yeah. that works. Okay. Do I need to keep pressing? No. Nope. I just realized this is your first That's time first at the time. table. Oh. oh my gosh, I'm so excited. And Congrats. I, I, well, thank you. And, and thank you, Chairperson Santana, <laughs> members of the Workforce Education Training and Youth Development Committee. I am honored to be the Chief of Education and really look forward to continuing to work on all things education with, it, with you. So I am excited. My first time up sitting at the table. So really appreciate it. Chief, now that you share that information, considering it's your first time, can you do like a two-minute sure. why would council members reach out to you? What is your role? Um, <laughs> Um, well, my role is a uh, significant and Im important role, but I also have uh, really no budget or actual decision-making power. I'm much more of an influence and try to be the liaison, not only between council and the administration, but also between council and the Cleveland schools, council and any of the other schools that are with, reside within the city of Cleveland. And I look um, at my 32-year career in public service as being just a, I hope to be a resource for anything and everything that you all are doing to support your residents in the city of Cleveland. Specifically, mostly importantly around education, whether it's CMSD, charter schools, Catholic schools. And I'm very lucky that I did spend um, so many years in the CMSD helping support members of um, the council. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm here to be uh, supportive in any way I can and answer any questions. But again, keeping in mind that the decision-making responsibilities are, are kind of aligned more with the individual schools, with the administration, or with the school board, but I'm here to help um, support where I can. Got it. Thank you, Chief. And today I'm really excited because I get to be with a lot of um, amazing partners mm -hmm. that you've worked with um, over the years, but in the space around some of these ARPA-funded projects and some of the other projects. So we're going to start, if that's okay, Madam Chair, ahead, with uh, Greater Cleveland Career Consortium. And then I'm going to I'm going to hand this over to you to start pushing us through. So the projects um, that we are, we're going to mention, and this is the order with which the slides go, are Cre Cle excuse me, Greater Cleveland Career Consortium, PACE, Say Yes to Education, Integrated Health Initiative, and the College Now Cleveland College Comeback Team. So in joining me to discuss the Greater Cleveland Career Consortium is the President and CEO, Autumn Russell, and I'll let her introduce her team. But I also have uh, Director Michelle Rose as well. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you for having me, um, and greetings to council members as well. Um, excited to be here at the table to provide an um, update around the Greater Cleveland Career Consortium and its role and support to uh, PACE implementation in CMSD. Um, extremely excited because I think the first time I was here was like day three of me in this role. <laughs> I and so uh, I look forward to just um, talking about our progress and uh, what we have achieved and uh, where we're going. Thank you. Um, before I start, if it's okay, I would like to acknowledge two team members that I do have um, in the room. Um, Katie Brennan, who is our Director of Development and Stakeholder Engagement, who manages all of our grants. And then I also have the Director of Career Pathways, David Gisaji, who uh, manages the pace implementation across all of our GCCC districts. So I thought it would be um, helpful and beneficial to do sort of a level setting and to talk a little bit about um, how we came here, how GCCC is supporting a CMSD uh, through the PACE implementation. 
just for context and background. And so there are three major buckets there. The first one is to really talk about how this initiative started. And back in 2019, as you may know, the Cleveland Foundation and a Cleveland Metropolitan School District co-convened a community planning and prototyping process to address the challenge of linking students to career pathways and regional opportunities. Now this process took about two years, um, but it included over 100 individuals cross-sector. So you had individuals representing education, industry, government, philanthropy, and nonprofit, all working together towards uh, developing strategies uh, to implement ways to connect students to careers. This was also after the data revealed that only about half um, graduating seniors were going to college. So at that time, there was only a 50% of students that were electing to go to college. And so it warranted the, the question around, are we preparing all students and how do we prepare all students for life after high school um, and aligning them to career opportunities? So a number of recommendations came out of this process under two foundational pillars. Uh, the first pillar was to create a student-centered career exploration and planning curriculum that sixth to 12th graders will matriculate through that included a series of in-class exploration activities, out-of-school employer-led um, work-based learning opportunities, and also an opportunity to um, chart their own career pathway based on all of the experiences, interests, and feedback from these activities and engagements. And so in 2021, November of 2021, PACE was sort of was born, and it was first implemented in CMSD November 2021. Now, also keep in mind that this was a um, sort of um, phase in approach, and so it wasn't at and still isn't at 100% implementation according to the, uh, to the PACE framework, but that's where some of these dollars are supporting moving forward. I think um, right after PACE was launched into CMSD, there was an aha moment from all of the partners that were part of this initiative, and the question was raised, how do we sustain the PACE initiative? We have all of these partners around the table, including industry, who are really at the table um, using PACE as a strategy, as a strategy, uh, strategy to address their talent pipeline issues and in an effort to fill the thousands of jobs that are available around the region. And so in order to sustain this PACE initiative, we must scale it. We must allow um, employer partners to not only connect with CMSD students, but also other students across the region. And so the idea was we need to create a consortium of the same cross-sector partners to help sustain, align, and coordinate, and uh, scale, pace, into different other districts. And so in March of 2022, the Greater Cleveland Consortium was launched as this collective of partners working together to sort of create this regionalized career pathway system where all of the partners across the region are working together to prepare students for careers. To date, we, um, the consortium supports 11 school districts, including CMSD. CMSD, of course, is the largest. Um, across the 11 districts, we serve about 33,000 students. 16,000 of them are represented at, um, in CMSD. Now talk a little bit more about what our supports um, look like. So the next slide is really what I call the cheat sheet, <laughs> and it is the difference in the relationship between PACE and the consortium, the Greater Cleveland Career Consortium, because oftentimes people get it confused. So PACE is the, the work, it is the curriculum that is embedded in the school day in CMSD, where students are matriculating through, they are participating in activities, participating in work-based learning opportunities, and at the same time, they are charting their experiences in an effort to have a career plan upon graduation. It's the work. The Greater Cleveland Career Consortium is the systems level, um, a systems level um, thinking, and it is the group of uh, cross-sector partners working together to ensure that PACE is implemented with fidelity. So that's the relationship and the difference. I just wanted to, I thought that would be helpful as we go into how these ARPA dollars support this work. So GCCC received uh, $2.1 million, million, excuse me, over three years to support two areas of focus. 
And what you'll see here on the screen is the focus in the first box, GCCC, is to support our gener general operating, which is our work to coordinate and con uh, work towards continuous improvement of the PACE framework. So again, that's talking about how we create the um, systems alignment, how we collect data. It is our responsibility to collect data, to aggregate, to analyze, to interpret, and to share data with the district and broadly um, in the community. And then the second focus is that PACE implementation that's actually happening in the districts where nonprofit partners and other partners are helping to uh, facilitate, coordinate, and uh, deliver the PACE lessons to students and are actually engaging with students. So you'll see on that right side, College Now, Junior Achievement, Youth Opportunities Unlimited, um, and Neighborhood Leadership Institute are working in the schools helping teachers and other educators develop lessons, they are facilitating lessons, and they are capturing feedback and insights from students in order to um, share with us the information so that we can use it for continuous improvement. And then on the right side, the employer engagement slash work-based learning opportunities, the Urban League of Greater Cleveland is helping employers prepare to hold and engage to hold um, quality work-based learning experiences and to effectively engage with young people through work-based learning. And um, the sector intermediaries represent industry sector partners that are hel that's helping us to create uh, career guides, helping us to align our curriculum to industry needs. Also hosting e uh, different events and we have dollars allocated for background checks to make sure that v volunteers can come into the buildings and also uh, transportation to any uh, career focused or work-based learning events. <coughs> on the next slide is how the dollars are allocated. So you will see right away the, on the left side that only about 6% going, is going straight to the consortium. That's the systems alignment, the data collection part of the work. 94% of these dollars, they're coming to us, but they're going straight to the partners to support the PACE implementation in the buildings and uh, the out of, out of school engagements that are led by employers. To date, we are um, about 60, I'm sorry, let me get this number correct. Um, we have spent about 44% of the budget for year one, um, mostly to our nonprofit partners, of course, how they're allocated, but we are, uh, we expect and anticipate spending all dollars down um, by June as planned. To the question I heard earlier, we are also leveraging um, dollars, so our, our Nonprofit partners and all of our partners, what we are doing, we're not creating anything new. We are aligning existing programs and exi exi existing efforts. And so when you mentioned like College Now, YOU, they are using their current dollars to align with PACE as well. So we're leveraging those existing dollars. And we also, of course, have raised um, other public and private dollars to, to um, support this initiative. So when we think about progress in CMSD as it relates to um, student engagement, the delivery of the, how much uh, framework we've delivered, and the employer engagement e uh, events, you will see there has been an increase from year one to year, year two in each of these buckets. Um, data from the first half of this year in CMSD, we are um, progressing at a very high rate in, related, uh, in relation to last year. And we anticipate meeting all the goals um, around framework delivery, which is around 80%, um, student engagements. We, to date, over 11,000 students have participated in the PACE activity. Um, and so we project that we will meet all of these goals um, in the time frame we anticipate, anticipate it. Great. And then our next slide, uh, if you don't mind sliding one more. Yes. Thank you. Through the chair, uh, any questions you may yeah. have. We thought it would be better to do questions for each one instead of having them at the end. So through the chair. So I am, um, let me know if you have any questions, but I just have one question because you answered many of my questions. But thank you for um, sharing the alignment with YOU. Like we just passed, um, I think, $1 million for YOU. And so it is my understanding, and please co correct me if I'm wrong. So let's just say we have a student who wants to get into nursing, 
right? So the Korea Consortium does the training or does kind of like the mentorship, and then YOU would hire them and place them in some type of healthcare organization? Is that the way? Yes, so Madam Chair, we will work together. Mm -hmm. Um, We will work with YOU to determine their capacity, what they have, and our role is to identify any gaps. So if there is a gap in, you know, they need to to get mentors, they need to um, maybe more funding to to implement. It is our role of the consortium to um, identify those gaps and to um, advocate to get those resources. So it may may look different case by case. Um, It could be that we do the training, but mostly we are aligning and coordinating, not um, implementing. Got it, okay. And director to the chair. Chief, but Director, I'm, I'm glad that you stayed. I know one of the things that you mentioned through building an environment at, in the beginning discussion of it was finding organizations and businesses that would hire. And I'm just curious to know a year out, where are we at with that? Like, for instance, my example of health. Is Metro Health hiring, right, um, these youth? To the chair, thanks for the question. And I'm here as a member of the Leadership Council of GCCC and as a huge supporter of the work, um, both at the PACE level and at the uh, GCCC level. All of the, everybody's hiring. (laughs) And in our community, we have particular concentrated needs across a few sectors that we've chosen to focus on. For a long time, that's been manufacturing, healthcare, tech, and now increasingly built environment, which you just heard all about. So we try to organize our work and our employer engagement in that way. I'll let Autumn talk a little bit more about the employer engagement intermediaries, but sort of how we are working to ensure that there is not just a training opportunity for each of these students, but a a job and an employer at the end of that journey too. Yes, through, uh, to the chair, we are working, as, as mentioned, we're working, there's a, a number of folks in the room that is part of the Greater Cleveland Career Consortium because it is our goal as the consortium to, again, align existing organizations and efforts and really move away from the isolated so many efforts that we have. We are the centralized resource. And so we're tapping into all of these programs in order to coordinate them and to communicate them as uh, one big initiative um, across the region. But as it relates to employer engagement, we are uh, leaning heavily on our cross-sector, I'm sorry, our um, sector intermediaries to um, to help us, as I mentioned, align our curriculum to ensure that students are actually going through programming that is aligned to what employers need and want um, in order to hire students. Um, we are also leaning on them to provide those um, work-based learning opportunities, so the internships, the tours, and the job shadowing coming into the classroom. We call them career chats to talk about their careers. Um, we are also um, leaning on our employer part, our sector intermediaries to connect us to employers in their specific industry. And so the sector intermediaries are sort of our advisory council to reach other employers um, in their in their network. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So first up, I have Councilman Jones. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, to the distinguished lady, what is your name? <laughs> Through the chair to the councilman, um, Autumn Russell. Who? Autumn Russell. She's got a beautiful name. <laughs> Let me just say this, for starters, um, and I do have some questions on this. Um, you, you, you did a great job in your presentation. Um, uh, I appreciate the fact that you talked about the program. It seems like you've touched, um, I would say, uh, a little bit over half of the students. Is that correct? That is correct. And that's impressive, to say the least. Um, so looking at this and seeing how it seems like you're, you're intensely engaged with what appears to be four different partners, well, actually five. Through the chair to the councilman, we have a number of partners. Are you referring to nonprofit partners? That well, will be the, five. What we have in terms of the, how many partners, uh, Madam Chairwoman, to Mrs. Russell? Through the chair. 
we have five anchor nonprofit partners that are working in the schools delivering the PACE curriculum. And then you, so you have nine nonprofit partners. Five. Five. And then how many for profit partners? We have, to the, through the chair, we have an exhaustive list of employer partners um, on, our, on our website, and I can also provide that to you. Um, and then we also have philanthropic partners. We have district partners, 11 district partners. If you can make that available, I would be interested Absolutely. in taking a look at that information. And then also, um, Madam Chairwoman, to Mrs. Russell, um, you know, one of the things, leveraging, and you touched on that, so you seem, you come to the table ready. So what is the leverage? What, what, what have you been able to get out of the corporate community to assist in this program? Um, through the chair, so we do, we have secured a dollars from a corporate um, funder, just one so far. Most of our um, dollars are public, um, but we have one um, partner that we've secured and we are in, we finally have um, developed our strategic plan, our first strategic plan that we um, will launch this month. And um, one of our strategic priorities is around sustainability and creating that uh, plan for sustainability. That includes advocacy, advocacy, communication, and a strategic way of fundraising. So our collective is working very diligently. Um, we've so far have uh, raised about 5.6 million uh, for this initiative, and uh, we're that will bring us to about 2026, but we are actively in this year working to develop a strategic plan to um, sustain this effort. Now, I, I got to say that, uh, you know, that just makes me excited. I'm getting goosebumps uh, as it relates to being able to take, and I want to make sure that I'm correct. Uh, we, we put into this program, was it 2 million, 2.1 2 .1 million? 2.1. Mm -hmm. And you have leveraged at 5.6 million, correct. is that correct? To, through the chair to the to And the you're monitoring to the, the programs to make sure that they're efficient and effectively operated? Through the chair to the councilman, yes, absolutely. And our scorecard will be readily, readily available to the community through our website. Um, April, April is anticipated. Yes, so you'll be able, anybody in the community will be able to um, go on our website, look at our scorecard, real-time data. We collect both population and program le level um, data, which population is how is this impacting the community. Um, and there's, there were a number of indicators that we are um, measuring in order to answer that question, as well as how are we effectively um, implementing the PACE framework. Well, I got to give my hats off, Madam Chairwoman, to Mrs. Russell and your outfit. Now, who are you with again? Who, who the Greater with? Cleveland Career Consortium. Uh, and, and who is that affiliated with? Or is that separate or is that uh, with the... It's a, uh, through the chair to the councilman. It's, it's a separate initiative, but it's a collective impact model. So there are cross-sector partners that's comprised of this group of people working together. I see. Um, well, I, you know, now, Madam Chairwoman, I'm not often lost for words. Um, but I really appreciate the professionalism that Mrs. Russell brought to the table. Uh, she has taken the scarce resources that we have here uh, and she's uh, quadrupled it. Uh, and this councilman appreciates that, as you may have heard me at the last, uh, at the last uh, grouping that was here, uh, talking about the $10 million investment, uh, it being an unprecedented amount of money. Uh, but to see that you have not only been a good steward of the resources we have given you, uh, but you have doubled that. And, and you are still in the proposition of not only uh, this program, but looking to, to continue its sustainability moving forward. And let me ask this, Madam Chairwoman. You stated earlier in your testimony that there was 11 school districts that you serve. Can, can you name them or can you... Madam Chairwoman to Mrs. Russell. Through the chair to the councilman, I was prepared for, the, for that question as well. Yes, so we have on Warrensville Heights, East Cleveland, Garfield Heights, Cleveland Heights, University Heights, Maple Heights, Brooklyn, Fairview Park, Richmond Heights, Bedford, and Shaker Heights. And I can provide that um, to you as well. I got it in the head now, okay. I don't need it. <laughs> now, now, Madam Chairwoman to Mrs. Russell, now this program that you have here is actually geared to students in, uh, in these schools uh, that will not go to college, is that correct? 
through the chair to the councilman, this is not a targeted intervention. It is this, this it, PACE is for all students. It is to ensure that all students have the opportunity to explore all the careers that we have available and then chart their path based on their career choice. I see. And, and Madam Chairwoman to Mrs. Russell, do you have a listing of those career paths? I mean, I'm quite sure that you don't do everything. Or do you, Madam Chairwoman to Mrs. Uh, Russell? Through the chair to the council, that is always the aspiration. We aspire to do everything, um, but we have started with our more in-demand um, sectors, uh, but we are, uh, we work towards the 16 career cluster that's identified by the state and I can provide that to you as well. Okay, and so it's, it's, it sounds like it may be pretty comprehensive. I would say yes. And, and let me ask this because it, it sounds like you're working uh, with young people starting at sixth grade all the way up to 12th grade. Uh, do you create a um, um, a file, so to speak, uh, concerning each student as they progress? And if you, if you do, can you elaborate, Madam Chairwoman, to Mrs. Russell, how that works? Sure, through the chair to the councilman. We do, we have a, um, a data system now called Pathways that collects all of the feedback, all of the activities each student participates in. So they, when they participate in one lesson, they have the opportunity to provide reflection. Um, on that particular activity. And our partners at College Now and other educators help us develop um, a career plan based on all of that feedback. And so once they matriculate through the high school, they then can tell what things they like, what things they didn't like, what are they interested in, how are their skills aligned to career opportunities, and that's how they decide which work-based learning opportunities they would like to pursue. And um, upon graduation, they will have a tangible career plan. That's excellent. And, and Madam Chairwoman, um, a, a number more questions and I'll be wrapping it up. Um, you, you have on there um, your progress with CMSD uh, and you have a number of employer-driven events, 54 events. Um, can you tell me what that is when, you, when, when I look at that there and it says, I want to say 58%? It's so small, I can't even see it. Yeah, it is on mine too. It's really sad. 58% uh, delivered or 60% delivered? What is that? Oh, the frame, yeah, so through the chair to the councilman. Um, the 58% delivered framework, that is out of the 100% framework, the number of lessons that are part of the framework, 58% have been delivered in that year. That's the first year. In the second year, we're now up to 78%. And let me also um, indicate that the data from the first year is the entire year. What you see in the second year is just where we are in January. So we will be even higher at the end of this year in comparison to next year. So you're ahead of your, your, um, your goals? Through the, through the chair to the councilman, yes. E elaborate, where were you, if you can, uh, where were you supposed to be and when? Um, through the chair to the councilman, we're, we're supposed to be, by the end of this year, at 84%. By the end of the year, we are at 60, 76%. Um, we anticipate to exceed that goal. I see. And, and, and Madam Chairwoman, can you give me an example, uh, Mrs. Russell, uh, one of the events that, that are employer-driven? Through the chair to the council, this would include internships. This could include uh, career chats where the employers come into the school buildings to talk about their careers and their trajectory. This could also include um, career-focused events. Um, it could also include um, just tours. So, for example, manufacturing plant tours give opportunities for students to see and, and you know, experience a day in a life in, in that plant. Um, and then it could also include job shadowing opportunities. Madam Chairwoman, when I tell you that this is the way all of our presentations should be presented to us after we give folks money, um, it's an understatement. And so I, I really appreciate Mrs. Russell's presentation. I appreciate the thoroughness. Um, I appreciate the fact that she's on top of her business and her organization is on top of their business. Um, I'd like to have an opportunity to come to some of these events. If you can take my number down, it's 355-0017, and invite me so I can experience it for myself. Um, I would be very appreciative. Um, I don't mean just to listen to the presentation. I want to be able to touch it and feel it so that when someone ever asks me a question about you, Mr. Russell, and your program, I want to be able to tell them because I experienced it. Thank you. 
through, you, through the chair to the councilman. I just want to thank you, but on behalf of the collective um, that has made such great progress, it was definitely a team effort, but I thank you on behalf of all of us. Thank you, Adam. And um, Councilman Spencer, I mean, Councilwoman Spencer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just add, as Councilman Jones's colleague, that is indeed high praise for those who have seen this gentleman at the table. So. I don't think it's ever <laughs> happened. <laughs> but I appreciated the, the presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're done. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you both. All. Thank you, Autumn. Thank, Thank you, you, Director. So up next, I'm uh, through the chair, I'm excited to bring up uh, Say Yes to Education. And we have with us today the Executive Director, Ms. Diane Downing, and she'll be joining us. And I think she'll be bringing a few folks from her team that she'll be able to introduce. Got it. And just um, for context, this is the Say Yes Family Support Specialist Gap Funding for 600000 Correct. Councilwoman Spencer is going to take over just I'll be sure. chair for a pro quick tem. break. <laughs> Here you go. Do you want to advance the slide? No problem. <laughs> or I'll advance the slide. Welcome and please proceed when you're ready. Sorry, too much, uh, too many things to distribute. No problem. But thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, okay. Go ahead. Here we go. Okay. Well, thank you. Madam Chair and members of the committee, um, my name is Diane Downing and I'm the Executive Director of Say Yes Cleveland. And to my left is uh, Sharice Ryan, who is the Director of Student Support Services and the person who supervises our wonderful family support specialists. So um, we're here today first and foremost to thank you all for helping us fill a gap in funding um, that occurred in 2023. Um, specifically, uh, the City Council approved $600,000 in ARPA funds so that we could help to fill a gap of $4.5 million. Um, by approving that uh, funding, um, and it was used in the early part of uh, 2023 for salaries and benefits for our 104 family support specialists. Um, this helped to ensure that the program uh, could continue. And the program specifically is the placement of a family support specialist in every CMSD school and partnering Say Yes Charter School. So again, there are a total of 104 family support specialists um, in the program. And what they do uh, is to provide the supports to students and families uh, so that um, students can get to school to learn and families can remain together um, throughout their child's education. Switch it. Who's got it? Okay. So uh, we finished the year of the fiscal year of 2023 uh, fully funded uh, with assistance, as I said, from City Council uh, and Mayor Bibb, as well as the county, CMSD, and state TANF funds. Going forward, as we began this current fiscal year, which started on July 1st of 2023 and runs through June 30th of 2024, um, we are fully funded. And that includes allocations from Cuyahoga County, uh, CMSD, our partnering charter schools, 
and state TANF dollars. So with that funding, uh, we, of course, are moving forward and continuing our commitment to Cleveland students and their families through these family support specialists. And going forward, um, we have also begun the process of applying uh, for Title IV-E preventive service funding um, so that we can provide a sustainable funding stream for uh, a major portion of the salaries and benefits for our family support specialists. In order to achieve that rating, that Title IV-E rating, we're working um, with the public consulting group and the Poverty Center at Case Western Reserve to conduct an evaluation um, demonstrating our program's impact. Um, I'm sure many recall that we launched in 2019. We raised up uh, and increased the family support specialists by cohorts. We started with a cohort of 16 family support specialists that year. And each year following, even during COVID, we uh, increased in the second year to 42 schools, then to 69, and finally um, to 104. So that evaluation process is underway. It will analyze data from our post-secondary planning system, where our family support specialists record referrals and case notes. It will also analyze data, attendance data, and other data from CMSD and our partnering charters, as well as data from the county's Department of Children and Family Services. And so that work uh, to see what types of in interventions we've done and what kind of impact it's had on students and families will continue uh, through the course of this year, and then we will be submitting our application for this sustainable funding. Um, I wanted to share with you um, the, top, top, the top five referral and case note category so that I can share with you the um, types of student needs that our family support specialists are seeing as they work in the schools every day. And so there is a listing. Um, the first category, stability and support for everyday needs, includes things um, like uh, clothing, um, housing, uh, support services like that. And then the others um, are more self-explanatory, mental health referrals, access to adequate nutritionist foods, um, grade level proficiency in English language arts and medical health. And these are all, both that column and the column for, that is for the full school year of 22-23. On the right hand side reflects the top five categories for the period from August through the end of January of this year. Um, at the bottom you can see the number, the total number of referrals that have been made to different agencies to help um, you know, work on these requests and also the total number of case notes that have been uh, filed by our family support specialists. And again, we use a, a system called the post-secondary planning system that was uh, developed and implemented as we launched Say Yes Cleveland in 2019. So that is how we, um, our family support specialists record uh, their referrals and case notes. Um, that is how we look at the cumulative data and uh, that is the system that we use as an online system for tracking. Next. Um, in addition, Madam Chair and members of the committee, I wanted you to know that one of my stacks of paper here um, is a cover letter and then a listing by ward of how many residents in each ward 
have taken advantage of the SAYA scholarship, what the cumulative dollar amount is uh, for those scholarships from 2019 through uh, fall semester 23. It also lists um, the names and phone numbers and emails for all of the family support specialists and uh, named by school um, in each ward and also by ward the top five categories uh, for uh, the listing for the needs in each ward by the top five. Um, last summer and spring, we were able to meet with certain members of council individually with our family support specialists in each ward. Um, I invite those of you, um, I invite all members of council to uh, join with us in that type of discussion uh, this year at your convenience. Um, but again, you will see a listing of all the schools in your ward, numbers of referrals and case notes, um, the names of the family support specialist and their contact information. And my contact information is on the front page uh, in a very, at the bottom of a very brief letter. And Madam Chair, may I give this folder to you? Are all the copies Are there? there? Okay, so we'll pass them down. They're, yeah, by ward. Oh, by so ward. yours is top, and then I think Councilman Jones might be next. So just in conclusion. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I just want to thank all of the members of council for rallying behind Say Yes Cleveland and our family support specialists um, last year in the allocation of those ARPA funds. Um, they were greatly needed at the time. As I said, they were spent quickly. And we have also shared with you that um, we have a path to sustainable funding going forward. Um, and this is such an important part of Say Yes Cleveland. As I stated, you can see the number of scholarships by ward, the scholarship dollars spent, and that's an incredible opportunity for all of our students who attend a CMSD or partnering charter high school for four years and live within the district. But we want to make sure that when they graduate from high school, they are fully able to use the scholarship. And that means providing supports to all students from the time they enter preschool until they graduate from high school. Diane, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. That doesn't capture in the how many have graduated, right? They would still be in school with? Yes, okay. the listing of um, the schools and the numbers there mm -hmm. are students who are still enrolled in those schools. Got it. Madam Chair. Thank you, Diane. And I had an opportunity to meet with um, my fam uh, family specialists. And they're wonderful. They're just, I mean, they understand the challenges that these families face. And I will tell you what came out of that is every time I have an event, I reach out to them. And then they organize all the parents for me. So it's been a great um, partnership. Um, another thing that came out of that was, at least for my area, the top concern was mental health. Um, and I think the struggle was access to mental health services because we don't have enough mental health services um, to service our kids' mental health, right? Especially if a student has language barriers, right? So I'm not sure where we're at, um, but I definitely, I don't know if there's any comment on that, if things have changed or if that's still an obstacle that our families are facing when it comes to mental health access or counseling. Yeah, Madam Chair, um, it is still a challenge. Um, as we come out of the pandemic, it's a great need. Um, our family support specialists are resourceful, um, but there is a continuing need in the community. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And Chief, I'm not sure if that's something that the mayor's working on, but it is um, an obstacle when a family can't get in for two, three months, right? And we know that the pandemic caused a lot of our mental health issues, especially around anxiety. So through the chair, our next presenters were going to be around the Integrated Health Initiative, which does kind of touch a little bit on that. Um, but to your point, through the um, Chairwoman Santana, the need around mental health supports in person, telehealth, um, is something that post-pandemic is, is at an all-time high. So regardless of which school you attend, I know that this is something that I Say Yes is addressing. We have our integrated health initiative. The district, CMSD specifically, has a, uh, a human wear, a mental health support department that is now part of integrated health and under the physical health and space that are connected and something that not only the mayor's initiative, but also one of my um, goals as chief education is to help connect the dots as we're doing today, career, college, mental health and supports for all students, knowing that it's not just the uh, six hour school day, but how are we making sure that we're supporting not only the students, but also their families and the staff members as well through some of the mental health crises we see. Got it, thank you. Um, and then just my last question, just because I have two kids in college, and while I appreciate Say Yes scholarships, do you think we'll ever get to a place where we're uh, funding in-dorm um, housing scholarships? Madam Chair, um, we are looking at certain enhancements um, to provide some funding for that aspect of post-secondary uh, college education. Um, more to come. Um, but we do see the need, Good, definitely. Yeah. yeah, it's just, I mean, especially getting kids out the environment. My kids were just so sheltered, and once they got out this environment, they're flourishing, yeah. you know, staying in school. They become adults by getting away from their parents. So <laughs> I just think it's yeah. an important piece um, for our Cleveland children. So um, Councilwoman Spencer. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the, uh, the ward specific updates. Thank you for preparing those and bringing those today. I have a few questions and I, I know that we've gone over some of this at the table before, but I just think it's always a great opportunity to remain on the same page. Uh, just the general difference between the funding for the family support specialists as opposed to the scholarship aspect of Say Yes, and I have a couple more questions related to really the question at the table today, which is related to our family support specialist funding. On the, on the scholarship funding side, how is that fund, funding stream looking? How are we doing on that side of Say Yes mm -hmm. through the chair? Madam Chair, to the councilwoman, um, we're doing actually very well. We've raised about $101 million um, for scholarships. And um, so that is, uh, those are pledges um, and everyone's paying on their pledge. Um, that is a separate 501c3 fund specifically called the Say Yes Cleveland Scholarship Fund. And it is housed at the Cleveland Foundation and invested by them. Great. Thank you. And then knowing that it's separate, uh, of th this is a great update. Of the $101 million raised, how much is that against the goal through the chair? Um, well, originally we had a goal of $125 million, um, but through investments and other um, uh, ways and summaries of looking at this, um, we are uh, looking at what we really need now. Okay, thank you. Uh, then to, to pivot back to our, uh, the sustainable st funding stream for the family support specialists, just because I'm not familiar, uh, through the chair, can you briefly describe what is Title IV-E? Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, to the Councilwoman. So um, just to take one quick step back, the um, Say Yes model is that the scholarships uh, would be raised by uh, the private sector. 
and the philanthropic community. And so we've talked about that. Um, the support programs and the families, specifically the family support specialists, would be publicly funded. So Title IV-E has really two parts. It's a federal program that then comes, the monies come to the state and then flow to the county. And the piece that the county is approved for right now for reimbursement is Title IV-E funding for children already in foster care. Um, so they are able to access that funding. And of course, we work with children who are in foster care and attending our schools, but it, um, it's only part of what Title IV-E could be used for to pro provide sustainable funding. So the other part is approval for preventive services. So that means um, our family support specialists working with a family and a student to prevent an eviction, to um, provide counseling, uh, to work with a, uh, other uh, organizations in the community to keep families together and students in school. And that is the um, approval that we are seeking um, to be able to apply for reimbursement for providing those preventive services. And so that's how we see that as a sustainable funding stream. Thank you. And if, if obtained, which we, this is everyone's hope, this is a big mm -hmm. effort that is important to, for sustainability. What percentage of the overall budget or need for our family support specialists would the Title IV-E cover? Madam Chair, to the Councilwoman, we are looking for the $4.5 million um, in uh, recovering that amount of money against a total budget of $9.4 million. The rest provided um, by county HHS funds in the, a total amount of 1.6 million, and then 3.3 million provided by um, CMSD and our partnering charter schools. And so I'll make a pitch that everybody vote for the levy because that is a critical piece of our funding. Okay. So. Thank you. And then, Madam Chair, just one concluding question, which is, it, it sounds like that, is, so just to clarify that the 104 specialists, that is full coverage. That means that there is a family support specialist at every CMSD school and every CMSD sponsored charter school at this time through the chair. Madam Chair, to the councilman, councilwoman, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Um, councilman Jones. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, when this first this piece first came across, I was uh, squarely didn't understand it, and uh, until Mrs. Downey came to the table to explain and break it down, and and I think at that time, Madam Chairwoman, and even to this time, um, uh, that it had broken my heart, uh, given the fact that our kids are in such dire shape, and um, if you could. You've given us a outline, Madam Chairwoman, a presentation for each ward. Uh, there is these numbers here, and I have all of the schools uh, listed. And the first number is 467. Uh, can you tell me what that first column? Um, yeah. Is that the number of population of the school? Are you at the very top of the page under scholarships or? I'm right here. If you can look at that number. Yeah, that's the number. What, what is that? Madam Chair, to the council, and that's the number in the school, I believe. So that's the number of students in each of the schools? Madam Chair, to the councilman, yes. I see. And then the second number is what? If I may ask, Madam Chairwoman, to Mrs. Downey. The, 
the second number um, numbers, Madam Chair, to the councilman are uh, head. The headline is referrals. And the third one, I would presume, is notes. Those are case notes, Madam Chair, to the councilman. Yes. I, um, each one of the uh, uh, specialist intake specialist, um, there's a number right there by them. Is that is that the the, the number that they have served? 196 students. Madam Chair, to the councilman, yes. On your presentation, you, um, Madam Chairwoman, to Mrs. Downing, you have the goals for, or the referral in terms of categories. For 2022 to 2023 and from 23 to 24, and I noticed that in the new category from 2023 and 2024, uh, 2022, 2023 didn't have vision in it. Can you elaborate the add-on of vision in that category uh, for the new 23-24 school year? Madam Chair, to the councilman, um, we wanted to give all of the members of council a snapshot of what types of referrals are leading the way. And that one is now appearing for 23-24, um, but didn't in the prior school year. So my colleagues from Integrated Health uh, are working on that as well. Um, it just, these different categories, many remain the same, but some change by school year. Um, so that is the general um, explanation, but each family support specialist would be happy to go through their um, post-secondary planning system referrals and case notes with you. I got it. Um, I appreciate it. Now, I just want to jump over here to uh, grade level, Madam Chairwoman, to grade level um, proficiency in English and language arts. So um, I presume that we're no longer having an issue in those areas? It's not included for the 23-24? Madam Chair, to the councilman, um, as we came out of the pandemic, uh, we had generally more requests for tutoring and assistance to get students caught up. And so that is why uh, we're seeing it in the 22-23 school year. I'm not saying that there, the need has completely gone away. It's just not within the top five anymore. I see. And then, Madam Chairwoman, um, my um, colleague, Jenny Spencer, talked about the funding. And um, she asked a question about the $101 million, uh, for scholarships for Say Yes. And she asked, what was the goal? And your comment was $125 million. Um, if you could elaborate on, um, uh, in terms of your need now, uh, uh, the difference of $24 million. Madam Chair, to the Councilman, um, the $125 million was the original projected goal for funding the scholarships for 25 years um, or two full generations of students. Due to um, the, uh, well, fewer children applying during the pandemic, as well as the investment strategy at the Cleveland Foundation, um, we have uh, taken another look at what we need to fund the scholarship for 25 years. And um, we have now put a pause on fundraising for the scholarships because we believe we will be able to have a 25-year program. And, and Madam Chairwoman, um, what is the population of the Cleveland Public Schools currently? 
Madam Chair, to the councilman, um, I believe it's 32,000. 30, yeah. And, and how many children, Madam Chairwoman, um, um, and this scholarship also affects um, charter schools as well? Madam Chair, to the councilman, only the Say Yes charter schools, and we only have two um, charter high schools that are Say Yes charter high schools. So overall, is it two in addition to elementary or junior high? Or is this, is it, it was just two schools, period, per se, yes? Uh, Madam Chair, to the councilman, I misinterpreted. I thought you were asking about um, just high schools and those students qualifying for the scholarship. So there's only two, Madam Chairwoman, um, to Mrs. Downey. So there's only two schools that are charter schools that will qualify because they're a part of say yes. Madam chair to the councilman for the scholarships, correct. But in total, we have um, between the K-8 uh, and the high schools, we have seven Say Yes partner charter schools. And of that seven, only two qualify for scholarships. Madam chair to the councilman, Yes, because only two are high schools. And, and Madam Chairwoman, to Mrs. Downey, what's the population for those two high schools? Madam Chair, to the councilman, I don't know the answer to that question, but we can certainly get it for you. And, and Madam Chairwoman, um, another request for information. So of, if we can just, because I, I would presume, Madam Chairwoman, to Mrs. Downing, um, the total overall charter schools, including the two high schools, would be seven total. Is that correct? Madam Chair, to the councilman, yes. If you could give me the, the names and the populations of the, the population numbers of those schools. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then, um, Madam Chairwoman, um, you talked about sustainability of the program. Um, what does that look like moving past the 23-24 school year, going into the 24-25 school year, and so on, et cetera? Madam Chair, to the Councilman, um, for the 24 to 25 school year, um, we are positioned to uh, look to receive funding from Cuyahoga County, um, again, depending on the success of the Health and Human Services levy, in the amount of 1.6 million, um, 3.3 million from CMSD and our partnering charter schools, and then 4.5 million in TANF funds from the state of Ohio that we are, in all cases, in all three, we are requesting and we believe um, through the legislative process we will be successful. I see. And so, um, you know, one of the things is, is, is bringing that out because, you know, um, uh, you know, looking at this, if you can't reach that goal, that was one of the reasons why you came to the table initially to ask for the funding, is that correct? Madam Chair, to the Councilman, yes, we had a shortfall last year. So, yes. so there's no guarantee that you can make this goal because you're still asking and you're hoping that maybe they'll come through again. And I think that, if you can correct me, uh, where was the shortfall coming from? Was it uh, the county, or the TANF funds? Madam Chairwoman to Mrs. Downey? Madam Chair, to the, to the Councilman, um, it was because the county was not approved to be a Title IV-E preventive services uh, funder. So are and they now, Madam Chairwoman to Ms. Downey? Madam Chair, to the Councilman, no. That's why we are embarking on the evaluation study um, to get that approval. but. Uh, we are seeking the three pots of funding for the next fiscal year um, that are the county, HHS, the school district, and our partnering charters, and TANF funding from the state of Ohio. 
I see. So you don't need the county, Madam Chairwoman, to the director for the new round of funding for sustainability? Yeah. I, I just want to try to gauge this. Okay. Madam Chair, to the councilman, uh, we do need the county um, in the coming fiscal year that begins July 1st of 2024 to June 30th of 2025. We um, are asking the county for 1.6 million in health and human service levy dollars. It is in their approved budget document that was passed on December 5th of 2023. Um, and so those are the county dollars for the next fiscal year. And so you see them being um, um, certified to be able to receive it within that space and time? Madam Chair, to the Councilman, I don't want to speak for County Council, right. um, but we were encouraged that it was part of their budget document passed last December. Thank you. No further questions, Madam Chairwoman, to Mrs. Downey. Thank you, Councilman Jones. Any other questions from my colleagues? Uh -huh. Councilwoman Gray. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, um, just, um, Ms. Dowling, thank you for that information that you shared with um, Councilman Jones. Uh, uh, it's a lot. It's a lot to know that the good work that you're doing. Uh, but I just want to say to you, Ms. Dowdy, that I spent um, the morning with uh, Charles Dickens this morning with Benjamin and, um, and a group of supporters of the kids at Charles Dickens, and they took me on a tour. And it was just amazing. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, the young ladies, uh, they were very engaging. Uh, they worked together as a team. Um, they spoke in rhythm uh, to provide me with information thoroughly as they took me on the tour throughout the entire tour. I was there for two and a half hours. I had no time limit. And I want to thank Benjamin for setting that up. I want to thank, uh, what's your last name, first name? Chief Pomerantz. The chief to, to set it up. They both set it up for me to go to the school. And it was just amazing, amazing. I took a lot of pictures of what's going on in Charles Dickens. That was the first time I really went through it. Um, uh, and it was a, it was a quick uh, scheduling. Um, uh, we had a meeting last month Great. with the staff, and they got me in uh, immediately. And um, I was so impressed uh, to see what Charles Dickens is doing and, um, and where they are. Um, uh, um, I got, like I explained here to uh, Ms. Dowling that I myself, I don't have uh, young kids in the school system here. I have teenagers in the school system in Virginia and um, they are doing amazing, but I have two adults, um, two young adults, grandkids that went through uh, CMSD, and they are doing amazing, amazing things in their life because of the CMS uh, school system, and they praise that still today. They reference, you know, where they are today because of the school system you know, with CMSD. So I just want to put that out there, uh, per se. And I, I shared that with the, um, the principal that I met to today and stuff. She's amazing. <laughs> she's, she's amazing. So uh, I had a fantastic time, a fantastic tour. And also I met uh, Anthony Hollins mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, YES program. I had a good time with him. He's thorough. He's a, he's a very exciting young man. He's in it to win it. I uh, told him I will be back soon uh, to take up more time with them um, to uh, uh, understand more of all their programs. It was just a good tour for me to engage to see the operations of uh, Charles Dickens. But I told him I will be back to take more time to actually understand and engage with all the operations at Charles Dickens. I met a, quite a few teachers, and I also met the, I also met the, uh, the uh, support um, 
uh, specialist mm -hmm. there, and um, she was amazing. Just to see that program and operations that you just spoke of, I was able to see that. And I mean, I, I just, I just had a wonderful time there to learn to know what's going on in the school system because I don't have any children, but to know the progress this uh, Say Yes program uh, has given and what it's doing in the school system. I am 100% supportive of it. And uh, um, I just love what it's doing. And it's, uh, and it's a gift to the kids to know that they have opportunities to move forward you know, with this program. So um, uh, I was just humbled to be in that environment and to see the kids today. Um, they love what they're doing, mm -hmm. and they have a very great support system with this YES program. So I just want to share that. I don't have a lot of questions. I see what you spoke there, right here on this, um, you, you know, right here on this document that you gave us. Mm -hmm. So I just want to share that uh, chair with Ms. Dowley and her team. Madam and, uh, Chair Benjamin, Council. Thank you for this morning. Thank you so much. We, we do have an incredible group of people doing Great work every day. Thank you. Got it. Thank you, um, Diane. Thank you for being here today. Okay. We good? Yeah, we're good. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next uh, group will be the Integrated Health Group. I'm excited to introduce from the Cleveland Foundation the Vice President of Proactive Grant Making, Dale Anglin, the uh, Gunn Foundation's Program Director of Thinking and Families, Marsha Egbert, and Jennifer Dodd, who is the Assistant, Education, Assistant Superintendent of the Educational Service Center, to join us as we discuss the next um, piece of information to share today, which is the Integrated Health um, Funding. Hello. This. Oh, um, sorry. I got. So you want to lead the um, yeah. integrated health? Like, yes. No. Okay. So there's a clicker. Mm -hmm. So this is 94-2023 CMSD integrated health for 3.7 million dollars. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank Didn't you. Didn't you retire? <laughs> not yet. I got one more week. I got one more, and I'm physically still here. Good. Okay. Well, <laughs> not, welcome. Thank you for no, your No, I'm time. moving to another position. Oh, okay. Yes, but I will still be around. Good. <laughs> I'm okay, not, not leaving Cleveland. Cleveland. No, I love this place. So um, thank you very much thank you. Um, to the chair and to the members of the committee. We're, we're going to talk a little bit and then whatever questions you have to ask. Okay, perfect. Um, we came before you because w even before COVID, um, we know that health of students is so important to academics, right? They're both equally important and they interplay with each other. They affect each other. So some years back now, I can't remember how many, way before COVID, um, several of us our foundations plus other partners in the space came together to think about what would it take so that um, starting with CMSD, we had, I would call it more and better healthcare. Partly because of Say Yes, it came with a attention to mental health. And what we said, when you come to Cleveland, you always Clevelandize anything. And we said, well, we need integrated health. We need both physical and mental. And this is way before COVID and everything that came out of that. So we came up with the Integrated Health Initiative. Um, our vision is to ensure that every CMSD scholar has access to physical and mental health services to help them successfully manage um, in life in general, but especially while they're in school. And um, we are building on what CMSD had already started. They already had had some mental health specialists in certain schools, and they had nurses in about half the schools. Next slide. So why school-based health? Um, just to ground us, there's tons of research out there that talks about uh, when you have access to health services, you have healthier students and families. These clinics are accessible to the families, to the kids, and to the teachers and, and uh, uh, administrators. They have better academic success. They have better connections to schools. Um, attendance rate usually increases when you have better health. Everything from better eyeglasses, right? So you'd have to stay out for dental support. Um, there's reduced emergency room usage, which we know is a problem in healthcare. There's lower Medicaid costs when you can attack, attack the problem as early as possible when a kid presents, as opposed to 10 days later when it's, it's acute. And so we also know that not, being, not having to take time off from work to take your kid to the doctor is also really important, not just to the kid, but also to the family and to the employer. And so for many reasons, it made sense to combine our efforts. Our first meeting 
in March of 2020 had 50 people in the room, every healthcare provider in the city, every mental health provider in the city, a bunch of foundations so that we could work together to figure out how to do this. And we're going to talk about what we've accomplished. Next slide. So before we, just before we get to this quick slide, I just want to give a um, shout out to this initiative. We have been able to do three things in addition to the money that you have given us. Um, we have put nurses in every single school building in CMSD for the first time ever. Um, that is alone an accomplishment, and I want to praise CMSD for finding their own money to make that happen. That did not come from ARPA dollars. We helped CMSD through some philanthropic support and their own money to create for the first time an office of integrated health so that special needs and mental health and physical health are all working together within the district so that they can play off each other because that was not the case in the district. And we have set it, we have worked with a bunch of partners and Marsha will talk about this to develop a pathway so that we can have sustainable funding for this work going forward better Medicaid reimbursement, a different way for the state to, to, to uh, work on these issues. So we'll talk about that because we knew from the beginning it wasn't enough to just start this work. You have to make sure that it's maintained. So I just want to give that in addition to the ARPA dollars that you gave us. So Marsh is going to start on the ARPA contract. Good afternoon. Thank you so much again for your support of the ARPA contract, the $3.7 million. And thank you to Chief Pomerantz and the whole team at the city for helping us navigate a tricky contractual process that took a minute, but has resulted in a really solid contract that we're now super excited to be able to get started to work on right away. But so let me tell you what that'll be about. Um, and what you're seeing here are two goals that were included in the the ARPA contract specifically. First was to make facility improvements to existing spaces to serve scholars' needs. So what we know is that really there was three different categories of um, health access needs that we hoped to resolve um, through the ARPA contract. The first was around medical equipment. We know things get outdated or we know things run out during the course of a school year that might be you know, the supplies, the medical carts, um, cold storage for vaccines. You know, these were the kinds of very nuts and bolts things that we weren't seeing sort of uniformly across the district. And they might be a little unusual to describe, but they're critical on a day-to-day -day basis for act being able to serve a child's needs in that moment. And so that's what you see in the first um, block there. The second was already referenced a little bit earlier around telehealth. Telehealth was starting just at the very earliest edge of, of being available in the district before the pandemic. And when we crafted the Integrated Health Initiative, it was for telehealth to be one of four delivery methods. Well, as Dale said, our first meeting was on March 10th, 2020. And by the... <laughs> By the following week, we knew we had to pivot to all telehealth if we wanted to do anything during the, the earlier stages of the pandemic. And so what this contract includes is the ability to, to build out the space, the tools, you know, literally the hardware um, and software that's needed and the, and the fast enough internet connection. Um, the space is around privacy. You know, we know every child deserves privacy in any kind of hel telehealth appointment. And then the tools and devices are obviously what connects the provider to the child um, in that moment. So that's the second big prong of sort of hard um, supplies. And then the third is really so exciting, three new on-site clinics. Um, we are in the process of winnowing the determination of those, uh, the sites of those clinics, and I'll sh we'll really thrilled to show you um, in the next set of slides what those clinics will look like. So two weeks ago, we had the thrilling moment of opening um, the first new integrated health clinic at Glenville High School, and this clinic represents the model for how the the clinics to be added through the ARPA contract will both proceed and look. So just, you can see here, it's really state-of-the-art um, medical equipment, wonderful, respectful space, um, 
and just you know a very professional setting that can respond to such a broad range of children's health needs in in that moment and so we have a team this is the you, this clinic and all of the clinics going forward represent a very deep community partnership so in the glenville instance metro health is our physical health care partner in this. You see the Metro represented by Dr. Erica Steed there, their CEO in the middle. But it is a true partnership between the school district, the, the behavioral health providers, the physical health providers, and the families and children themselves. This is the Metro Health team that is assigned to do school-based health. So they work across a number of settings and we'll be getting to a slide where you can see what physical health provider is where at the moment. But just wanted to show you that this, you know, this is a, a system commitment on behalf of Metro Health. And we're thrilled that the Cleveland Clinic will now be coming into the Integrated Health Initiative as well, which will um, really substantially boost our capacity and that Care Alliance, one of our key neighborhood-based family, uh, federally qualified health centers, is also a partner in th three schools in this year. The second goal is to really take what is the new resource that will be available through the on-site clinics the telehealth capacity and mobile clinics and build awareness for parents and guardians and students at every school all across the district around this new set of services. And to access it, that is triggered by the family signing what's called a universal consent form. And I have a particular streak of gray hair around what it took to get that universal consent form through all of the processes with the partners. Um, it was a two-year process um, inside the Cleveland Clinic, inside Metro Health, inside the Qualified Health Centers, our behavioral health providers. As you might imagine, they all sort of had their own ways of doing business. They all had their own sort of sign-up ways. But we needed to really commit to touching every scholar in the district. We needed something that was uniform across the district. And that consent form is now active, really, uh, as of the second semester of last school year and now in this, uh, in this uh, sem first semester of 23-24. And what you see here are listed are the, ARPA, the city ARPA contract expenditures that we have identified as being central to really socializing that consent form across every nook and cranny of, of the district with every family. So we know it takes multiple ways of reaching families and reinforcing that this is a safe and healthy way of serving their children. So you see the expenditures outlined there um, that will go forward. So it's coupling this slide with the actual physical capacity uh, infrastructure investments that is that comprises the two components of the city ARPA contract. Sources and messengers and opportunities for families to really absorb this new information and feel comfortable in signing that consent form. Lastly, we wanted to make sure that you had the information about which schools were being served by which provider. And what you're seeing here, and I'll go back to this previous slide and you can flip between them. This, is the, this reflects the physical healthcare partnerships which we're still continuing to build out. So that's not yet available for every school, but this is substantially expanded um, with the addition of the clinic and um, Metro Health taking on more schools and Care Alliance. So that's a work in progress. And then we're happy to share with you this um, handout, which represents all schools currently have, do have a behavioral health partner, and some have two. And so you can see the complete roster of schools and partners for behavioral health services. On that point, there. Madam Chairwoman, for clarification. Um, the, what you have in the green and one in the red, is that uh, 
to be announced, or, or is, is the red so you don't have it, or no. the colors Sorry. don't mean Sorry, it was anything. just to, dis well, the colors represent Carol Lyons is green, Cleveland Clinic is red, Metro Health is blue. It's just to dis distinguish between the three providers. So does John F. Kennedy have Cleveland Clinic right now? That's exactly okay. right. Okay, thank you, Madam That's Chairwoman. exactly right. Yeah, so I was, um, in, in sharing the fact that Glenville opened two weeks ago, it's also really exciting to share that simultaneously, full school-based clinics opened in Clara Westrop on the west side and Mound School on the east side. And those three together really are the model clinics that we'll be duplicating in this next set of three clinics that will be resulting from the city ARPA contract. Thank you. Okay. Thank so, you. You're done? Yeah. So thank you for that. Thank you for this list. Um, and as I was, um, you're on the list. As I was sharing with Diane, um, the top concerns in my area was mental health. And one of the things, I know they mentioned all these health, me, uh, mental health partners, but it was accessibility. I mean, it's one, two months that you're waiting for initial counseling appointment. And then also, like the repetitive, you know, reoccurring um, right. in, uh, appointment that takes place. So. He'll probably kill me for saying this, but, you know, just by being a mom of a student that, um, a son that just high anxiety, he had, I mean, we went through so many barriers to get him a counseling appointment to see, you know, access for someone to, you know, see him online. And not all counseling workers worked for him, right? You have to have the compatibility of it. And the insurance. So, I don't know. I'm just very interested in this area. I know that this is a start, but the more and more I've experienced that, the more and more I talk to students, they're suffering. They're suffering mentally. So I know, once again, this is a start, but um, I would be very curious and, and working something out to ensure that many of our CMSD Cleveland students are being serviced and um, following up, right? So with that being said, one question. Why Glenville? Why did we start at Glenville? <laughs> Sure, I'll take that one through the chair. Uh, at Glenville, of course, you know, is a right next to, I think, the uh, John, is it the J. Glenn Center, Metro Health Center over there? And I think one of the reasons um, that Glenville was selected was, was the J. Glenn Health Center was nearby, and also there were, um, uh, I think, some coursework. And the lab areas over there. Or LP, I think LPN coursework over there as well was one of the reasons that Glenville was selected. Um, so I think at the time, the thinking um, from the former CEO and the team that was working on it were to find ways that they would make it not only accessible for students and families to get better health and opportunities, but also to be part of that pipeline of training and creating that workforce that we've talked about earlier in the, the presentation. Um, I know um, Clara Westrop was also a school that was selected. I think that's in Councilman Slife's ward. And I think what they were working on at the time was looking over at the map to make sure that they were considering where there were other hubs and spoke models so that Glenville could complement the other schools that are nearby to make sure that the students that were in those neighboring um, schools could visit to that uh, Glenville Health Center. And the same thing with Mound, which I think was the original first um, clinic, health-based clinic in, in, in the south side over there. So as we look at the next three locations for these clinics, I think there is definitely going to be a um, an ask for members of council and this committee specifically to give us your feedback. We want to make sure that we consider those health deserts. Um, I know St. Vincent's closed last year and where are other places that we can make sure that not only do we have the physical space, that we make sure that we don't run into any cost overruns, but we also have a, uh, a school culture that is welcoming to outsiders because it, it can sometimes be difficult to have, you know, six nurses there every day and we want to make sure that we're working with the school district with all of you and with our leaders to see what best practices were done to make sure that we make the selections for the next three got it thank you 
Um, second question. It's been a while since I've been in school, but it was my understanding that there was a nurse in every school at one point. Not, not in a long time. I mean, decades. Decades. It's been decades. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Decades. Back when I was teaching at Ben Franklin, That's through the chair, when I was teaching at Ben Franklin, I taught 22 years at Benjamin Franklin, and I think my former first grade student is here in the working for you now, Rosie, um, <laughs> she can attest, uh, she was one of my first grade students. The nurse was there one day a week, and, and heaven help you if you got sick on any other days of the week. Um, but what's great about the, the, the school nurse program and the integrated health is that this not only helps uh, students, but also the staff and their families to help ensure that teachers are there, there's less absentee rate because they can check in with their um, integrated health and see if they, if they have something that they that they need to see the um, the nurses with um, so while there were nurses there probably a lot of times the school secretaries or the teachers kind of filled in for the days that the nurses weren't there yeah got it so um, I was also at Metro Health when they had the um, mobile clinic mm -hmm. that was outside of Lincoln West they that still, still exists yes. right yes. Yes. but I remember at some so many points like they would just be sitting there because there was like no students coming in I'm just curious to know that's, how is this gonna change now um, so that's one question the second question is I know we talked about when we approved this like is this gonna be open to families in the neighborhood right yeah, um, so that you can yeah. get the reimbursement so that you could sustain the project so I guess two questions and sure to the chairwoman to um, to but first on the first question one of the reasons we asked for dollars around a community engagement and education is I think we've all come to understand in the past few years that some of us, some people might have known this, but I came to understand it. The healthcare system is confusing. And even if you are sick and have issues for your kid or for yourself, it is not easy to figure out or to trust who to go to. And so we knew going in, as we built this system, we had to have a way to educate, engage. And so even, even you know, we had those mobile clinics, you're right. There sometimes were not students going to them because they didn't trust them. They didn't know the provider inside there. This part of these ARPA dollars is to really go at that problem in multiple languages, in every corner, so that they can get to know the different providers, because they're different ones, and they treat you differently depending on who you go to, right? So how do we work through, and we knew we needed some dedicated staff for the first couple of years to make sure that that, but we had to have something for them to attach themselves to first. So we built the system. Now we want to make sure people understand how to use that system. Um, so by the way, in your communities, if they're, once this staff is, is hired, we would like them to come out, like you said, you met with the family support specialist. We would love them to come and come around to you guys and talk about if you have ideas on ways for them to get to know the families better so that they understand them and they have a better sense of their needs. Um, Marcia, to you. Oh, I was just going. I was just going to add. Thank you, Madam Chair. That having that school nurse in every school building helps enormously in getting the the connection to appointments in the mobile clinic, or right? making you know making sure that those um, time slots are filled. Whether it's for preventive kinds of care, early intervention, if, of course for students that are feeling ill um, on a particular day or staff. But we really needed that. Um, you know, five day a week presence yep. to be able to build the structure that would lead to maximum utilization. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a it's a piece, there, lots of pieces and parts are fitting together here, but um, really we're just incredibly encouraged about how far it's come during a pandemic. Yeah. Got it. And I would say success, I mean, just coming from having a health care background, is making sure that these families have a primary care physician where they're continually going and, um, yeah. you know. There's going to be a lot of education as part of this. Yeah. Good. Oh, I love all this type of work. It's exciting. <laughs> um, Councilwoman Gray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just to echo uh, what um, uh, Councilwoman, uh, our Chair, just stated uh, about the health school clinic opening. Meaning, is it going to be chaired to in the panel? Health school, is this going to be a school where, health, health school, is it going to be a school where the students are going to be able to take class to learn about health, Claire, like a class they take with the regular classes, and also slash clinic for them to go to to get the care 
That's a that they bill. need from right. a like the like the sure. clinic in the in the neighborhood and also like the mobile uh, uh, clinics. So I think the at Glenville in particular, you know, we have various career pathways at different schools. Glenville has the health has one of the health career pathways, okay. and so by having this clinic there, you can help the students access, see, understand be involved in understanding what, what is involved in working in that field. Okay. So that was another reason to put it there, because there you have students there who want that career. And so this is a way for them to practice, to be honest. And okay. Metro Health is completely open okay. to helping them, helping working with the teachers to make to give them access to that. OK. And that second part is this also for them to get the uh, health care, like you go to a doctor's appointment. Yes, yes, they well. can do full, full physicals, um, deal with acute issues, um, you know, emergencies that come up. Those clinics can handle all of that. Oh, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, and I can understand why uh, Glenville, why not yeah. every other part. This is amazing. And my uh, second um, question, Chair, to the uh, to the committee, I noticed here um, on your uh, um, initiative, behavior health partners, here on for John. For Charles Dickens, you have Murtis Taylor. Uh, Murtis Taylor, and I get the mental health partner because I was at Charles Dickens today and they have the social su support uh, service. That's good, but that is a K through eighth grader. Mm -hmm. Now, Murtis Taylor is a, per se, deal with mental illness I'm not sure because I because I, I visit because I vis, visit Merle Taylor, but I haven't did the complete tour with um, with Director Custer. At this time, I got to go back and do the complete tour per per department to understand what each department of their representatives do within their field. So my question is this: that is as far as I was able to see to understand. That's more of a uh, 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 older adult, older a singer. These are children. Uh, these are K through mm -hmm. eighth grade. So why would you have Murthy Taylor as the mental health partner, other than say a uh, uh, Buckeye uh, Metro a Buckeye Metro Clinic uh, to deal with that in that capacity? If they have the social services, uh, social service support there versus what Marilyn, you know, Marilyn Taylor provide, per se, chair to the, any of the, the panel. Thank you, through the chair to Councilwoman. I appreciate that question so much because what we know, in, well, first of all, in this instance, Murtis Taylor, for everywhere that you see Murtis Taylor referenced here, they will be providing ch services to children. Okay. So they have a, a, a division, a department, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what they call it, internally, but they have a division that works with children okay. on behavioral health issues. So they bring that expertise as well as the adult. I think they're sort of more known for okay. their adult services, okay. um, but they absolutely have the children's focus as well, and we'll bring that. And then in terms of your question about how, does, how do we complement that with the physical health services? Mm -hmm. So what we know, what we've learned through this process is that we won't have um, full-blown in-school clinics in every single school, mm -hmm. but we need a network of clinics in a hub and spoke model mm -hmm. so that they're the full-scale clinics across the city are available through this hub and spoke to all the schools around it. So for example, in the, where um, Charles Dickens is, there would be, you know, we would look at that geographic area mm -hmm. and look at the schools in a whole geographic area and figure out what one school should have the full-blown in-school clinic mm -hmm. that other schools in that geography can be referred to, mm -hmm. but the behavioral health provider would be available at every school. So it's just um, managing resources mm -hmm. while also making sure this is a universal program in terms of access. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Good answer. Yes. Councilwoman yeah. Green. Very detailed. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Okay. I am so excited. Um, 
about this investment. I really think, I mean, you said it's a starting point, but I, I really think that this is going to be uh, huge and very impactful for our families. As I ran on a platform, health is everything. Health, health is, is wealth. Like, it, it, health is wealth, right? So thank you for all your thank work. You. I didn't get thank a you. chance to hear from you, Jennifer. That's okay. You're gonna, they're, I'm just here to help these wonderful people do the work they need to do. So the Educational Service Center works with schools all across Northeast Ohio. Um, we're actually in revised code to provide some services, but we can also help whomever, however we want and they need, and mm -hmm. um, youth and families. And so we'll be administrative fiscal agent on this project. Got it, mm -hmm. perfect. And one last thing I want to add, going back to my community outreach work, I remember there was curriculums, educational curriculums around, <laughs> right? Sex topics, yeah. health, yeah. Um, addiction. I mean, so yeah. now you don't see that anymore. But, but I will just say, through the, to the chairperson, we've already been hearing anecdotally that with the nurses in the buildings, they're coming up with things that they think should happen. Mm -hmm. We just didn't. They weren't there every day, so they could, even if they even if they had the idea, they wouldn't be able to implement it. But now with them there, with the family support specialists there, they can work together to think about what is needed. Because sometimes a kid doesn't necessarily need a person right then and there, but you could do group classes. You know, there's a lot of things you could do prevention-wise when you've got the right staff in the school to head off before something bad happens. Yeah, right? it's just mean, meaningful work. And I know funding is also, I mean, it's a barrier, but it's like the return on the investment doesn't come yeah. right. You know, right away. Right. It's like long-term, but um, I don't know, I'm just a huge community outreach and engagement um, fan. So thank you for your work. Um, did you have questions? Okay, you have 10 minutes and then we have <clears throat> to do our last presentation. I was hoping to get out of by 4.30. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, you know, quite a bit of information has been across us on this uh, 3.7 uh, million, and I presume that uh, the Cleveland Foundation is finishing the scholarship. Actually, the contract for this ARPA contract is going through the Educational Services Commission. Um, the, the, the three staff will be employed by them, um, and the CMSD will work with them on building out the clinics. Okay, so the foundation didn't have any involvement, Madam Chairwoman, to Mrs. Uh, Dale England? We sit on the, there's an executive committee um, to the chairperson, to the councilman of, I think there's like 15 of us now from the district, the city, the unions, the health, some of the health providers. We all sit together every month to make sure we all understand what each other are doing in these spaces. Um, ESC will also sit there. So the Cleveland Foundation is represented on that body, but for these ARPA contract dollars, the, the actual contract is with the Educational Services Commission. Educational Service. And who's Madam Chairwoman over Educational Services? So I'm Jennifer Dodd. I'm the Assistant Superintendent at the Educational Services Center of Northeast Center. Ohio. Uh, we're kind of the best kept Jennifer secret. Jennifer Dodd. Dodd, D-O-D-D. -D. We're kind of the best kept secret until you get to know us. But we're in law to support school districts. Um, that's our primary function. But we're the largest one in the state, and we serve districts, partners, the county, um, you know, the city on a lot of different projects. We, while we do professional development and teaching and learning and all those things with our schools, we also do hiring, we do fiscal agent work, we do behind um, back office work. And so we can be that behind the scenes support and for this project, that's our role. And that's what you've been doing, coordinating to make sure that uh, all the CMS2 schools have a um, health um, we nurse. We will be. So, but we got them all in there now, is that correct, Madam Yeah, Joel? that was through the work that they've been doing. So we're, we're stepping in out going forward. So you're gonna take over the, the task that uh, the foundation has put together, is that correct, Madam Chairwoman, to Mrs. Dodd? the advisory group has been working on, right, Marsha? They'll manage this particular city contract. Okay, great. Are you, can I ask, because you great, gave a great presentation, what's your name? Mine? Yes. Uh, Marsha Egbert. I'm with the Gund Foundation. You're with the Gund Foundation? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we got a number of foundations here. Now, let me ask this question, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, how, sustainability. Now, the city of Cleveland has given $3.7 million. How do we sustain this? And that's open, Madam Chairwoman, uh, to anyone who, who wants to answer. Thank you, uh, through the chair to Councilman. We really appreciate that question because it's a question that has been on our minds from the first day before the first meeting of the Integrated Health Initiative. So let me, if you don't mind, I'll first share with you what we've been able to leverage so far. Um, 
over the time period of the of the initiative. So we have $3.9 million in local philanthropic investment. So the Cleveland Foundation, the Gund Foundation, Mount Sinai, Bruning, Woodruff, a number of uh, our local philanthropic partners have invested deeply in this, in this work. Metro Health received almost a $5 million grant. We had advocated in Columbus for state ARPA dollars to go to this work and they agreed and Metro secured the largest grant in the state through an open competition through those state ARPA funds of just under $5 million. We recently were awarded a $970,000 grant for an experiment that will go forward in two districts in the, in the state, Cleveland and Nelsonville in the southern part of the state. And in Cleveland, it's at Alfred Benish School. And what this partnership is, is taking the managed care organizations that the state contracts with to provide all Medicaid services to bring them into the schools. That's not really where they've been in the past. And when I mean bring them in, it's to encourage managed care organizations to start paying for school-based health care in a way that really focuses at the early end, the prevention and early intervention with children. And so working with the principal at Benish, um, he and his leadership team identified three social determinants of health that weren't being addressed that the managed care organizations are now going to help with. At Benish, it's um, outdoor space. They're going to improve an outdoor space that will allow them to open a preschool and provide a healthy outdoor space for all their students. It's vision services, so not just screening, but also access to glasses or any other vision correction care that's needed, and then hunger relief services. And those were identified by the school as three types of health-related um, status that weren't being addressed. And what the goal of that partnership or that experiment is, is to eventually have the managed care organizations across the state be a partner in early inter prevention and early intervention school-based health services. So we're really excited to have been chosen as one of the two sites in the state. We requested $400,000 for that pilot, and they awarded us $970,000. So that was a great return. <laughs> that was great. And then last but not least, currently, we also um, led a coalition in Columbus to get state general revenue funds into school-based health care for the first time. Happy to report that the Department of Ohio Department of Health is now the keeper of $15 million, uh, a specific line item for school-based health that they are um, dispensing through request for proposal processes. CMSD is eligible for the third RFP. It has not yet been released, the first two have. So the third one is forthcoming, and that will be for districts that have already invested in school-based health but want to expand. So those are all in process now or already been secured now. The big picture is to convince the state to apply and receive expanded federal Medicaid funding that they are eligible for but have not yet pursued. So while we aggressively pursue that big picture um, sustainability, we've been working in the interim on all of the pieces that I shared with you a moment ago that have and, allowed us to grow and expand. And what's your name again? I'm sorry. Just one more time. Marsha Egbert. Uh, Marsha Egbert, you know, I, you know, I uh, congratulated the, the other presenters. Um, certainly when I sit here at, at this table and, um, and make decisions on critical funds, and 3.7 is certainly not to sneeze at, but to see here that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that total overall 9.8 million? that you've been able to bring in or to leverage the so, 3.7 so far, but we expect, we really expect to do well in that RFP well, that's coming. Let me say this, my hat's off. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that 
you know, citizens want to see, that their tax dollars are being used, is being leveraged, and we're expanding services that impact uh, our kids and our schools. And, and I'll say um, I am very impressed at the fact that you have been able in your presentation to expand um, a nurse in every single school. Uh, I am also uh, excited about the fact of the services uh, that you have, uh, the capacity and the build out. Um, and just the team that you have assembled together seems like a dream team uh, with the various different foundations put together. Uh, you are showing that not only are you using this money that the city has given you, um, but you've also been able to expand it and to highlight uh, future funding that's coming to, um, to our schools. And, and I, I'm going to say this because, you know, this is really important for, for you know, given today's health climate uh, in the nation uh, and probably the entire planet. Um, it's so critical now. We're seeing um, obesity in young folks, and we're seeing health problems in young people uh, at the level that we've never seen before. Uh, we know that a lot of the food that we're eating is not healthy. So to see you here putting this together and making this a priority, and then moving to go above and beyond, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm just thankful that we have your team here assembled. And uh, Mrs. Uh, England, when you uh, said that you were leaving, I was shocked. I said, no, we can't, leave. we can't lose her. Um, so I really appreciate what the Cleveland Foundation does and the Gunn Foundation. Um, I, I would hope that you would stay with this. Uh, this group stays together um, and not just hand it off if you can. Um, because the, the future is uh, in terms of health for our young people, for their education to improve, um, they need all of the services. And we never had these kinds of services that you're offering today. And so let me ask this, because the, uh, the chairwoman hit this issue. And I think this issue is important, too, if you can put this in somewhere, because today's issues with young people and mental health is critical. Uh, today, young folks have all of these cell phones and social medias. And, and I'm seeing it now often more than ever before. I see young people on their phones. And, um, and they're at these social media site locations. And, you know, um, a lot of fights are getting started in elementary schools uh, with social media issues and some of the kids uh, uh, being impacted by these issues uh, uh, has went as far as to have trouble in school, starting fights, and then in some instances, unfortunately, suicide. And so the issue of mental health today is probably more critical now than it has ever been before uh, because of the add-on to social media. Uh, are we looking at any, are we looking at that as a committee? Can, if we're not, can we start looking at that as some kind of level of possibility of, of, of offering? Madam Chairwoman, to anyone who would add, you know. So uh, I'll, I'll take that through the chair to the councilman. Uh, the idea of social media and its impact on uh, mental health is something that I think would be a good topic for the integrated health team to focus on. I know that's something that um, usually, I'm not sure who puts the agendas together, but I think that's something that we should be able to bring back and also to see what, what, um, what they're measuring around this at, at this time and see if we can find not only any, uh, see what the data is currently, but any correlations and how the district and individual schools are managing the use of cell phones within schools. I know that um, my colleague, Chief uh, Sonia Pryor Jones, also works in the space uh, uh, around safety and including mental health. And so that's something that we can kind of tag into her um, outreach to the school district as well to get some feedback for you to be re able to report back. And, and that would be nice. And. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I just you know want to say I, this is this is another great production uh, of use of, of funds, and I really appreciate the work that you all are doing for our young folks uh, and, and schools, and um, and and just you know, I appreciate um, uh, you looking into this issue mm -hmm. uh, on health. Uh, it is a issue, um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it has been the cause of, of death in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, and um, and this is going now. I'm thinking, roughly six years now. So this is an issue, mm -hmm. uh, in our, and our and the bad part about it is the young people. It's in elementary. I mm -hmm. mean, now high school is one thing, but 
to have elementary kids distracted in school because of social media. And so we have to find a way. I don't know how we do that, but there needs to be discussions on how we limit uh, cell phone use uh, in the classrooms um, and, uh, and how we, we prevent uh, some of the distractions and also uh, the fighting that's going on right now. Thank you. And Madam Chairwoman, again, thank you to this group. Appreciate Councilman the work you Jones. do. Thank so you. here, no other questions. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you for your report thank for you. being here today. And now we have last but not least. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, um, thank you Chair, Chairwoman. Um, our, our last but certainly not least um, presenters today are coming to us from College Now. I'm excited to bring up um, Chief Executive Officer Dr. Michelle Scott Taylor and Maggie McGrath, who is the Executive Director of the Higher Ed Compact of Greater Cleveland. And I appreciate all of your patience and sticking with us today. Yeah, thank you. So thank you so much for having us. And from your lips to God's ears, I'm the president right now, not just yet the CEO. <laughs> oh Lee is still CEO. Lee is still the CEO. But I apologize. <laughs> claim it. Yes. <laughs> you know. I will claim it. Yeah. All right, so thank you so much for having us. We're very happy to be here. We're here to report out on some dollars you all shared with us back in February. Mm -hmm. So just to give a little bit of background, um, by the year 2025, Ohio set a goal that 65% of Ohioans between the ages of 24 to 64 would have some post-secondary education. That could be a four-year degree, it could be a certificate, or it could be a workforce credential that has value to it. Currently, only 49% of Ohioans have these credentials, 51% in the nation, and Cleveland, unfortunately, is at 39.7%. 0.7% with our population having an associate's degree or higher. What we know is that 60,000 Cleveland residents have some college but no degree. We affectionately call them the comebackers. What we're hoping to do is leverage what college now already does, what we already do around helping young people and adults navigate college and career by leveraging our adult learner program, which serves adults throughout the region, as well as $1 million we received from the county to provide debt forgiveness to those who want to go back and re-enroll in college. So we're really trying to leverage existing resources to make the most of this opportunity you all shared with us. What we recognize is that we really needed more efforts around marketing and promoting the services that we provide to our residents. So if you go to the next slide, mm -hmm. um, the timeline of what has happened is in February, you all approved us for $300,000 of ARPA to spend over three years. And we were very intentional to target city residents who had some college but no degree. So we're very intentional about trying to uh, have a greater impact with these dollars by focusing on those who had, a, who had the gumption to go off to post-secondary, but for other for whatever reason, weren't able to persist to completion. And Michelle, that was just advertisement, right? Like that was. It's a little like bit more. Okay. It's, Sorry. it's a. I'm no, that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's a comprehensive marketing plan that Maggie's going to talk about in just a second. Mm -hmm. In July, we signed a contract uh, with the city. In September, we signed an MOU with Singleton and Partners to develop and implement our Comebacker campaign. And then, in de from December to February, we our media campaign ran. Yep. So. So what will we do over the next three years, just so you have a sense of how we intend to, con to continue to spend this, the funding, we're creating and launching marketing campaigns to re-engage those adults that have some college and no degree. We're promoting available programs and funds to help them enroll. We're providing debt forgiveness opportunities so that if they have a debt or a bill at Cleveland State, they can come to college now, get re-enrolled, and have that debt forgiven. Mm -hmm. We're also providing support services for information through our resource center at College Now. Maggie and others, we partner very closely with a number of higher ed institutions. She works very diligently to try to problem solve and break barriers to folks uh, being able to get back into school. And then we're hoping that we can continue this debt forgiveness program so that we spend out all the money and that more people can re-enroll and that debt is not a barrier to finishing a degree. So I'll turn it over to my colleague Maggie, who's going to share a little bit more about this campaign that we've been doing for the past few months. Thank you, Michelle. So I'm just going to spend a couple minutes talking about what we've done so far. Um, 
As uh, the chairwoman said, the vast majority is going to a media, social media and um, marketing campaign. So since December, we launched uh, website ads and you can see examples here of what some of those have looked like and the top websites um, that they have been on. Total impressions for website displays has been nearly 1.2 million, which we are very happy with. Facebook and Instagram, as you can probably imagine, have also been our most popular um, social media placements with impressions. Again, just people viewing these ads um, has been over 4 million with click rates over 5,000 um, if you total both together. So again, very happy with sort of click through rates that we're tracking over the last two months. And then we're trying something new with targeted video um, concepts, and this is on social media um, through those Facebook and Instagram platforms. Um, and you can see here we have almost 100,000 people seeing these with 285 click-throughs on these videos. Um, we're using paid actors, uh, and this has also been very successful. So we tried one the last two months, and you can see here sort of a picture of that, and we're gonna try a second one um, in the next uh, phase of, of the uh, campaign. <laughs> We also did two weeks of radio spots on the um, radio stations you see listed here. Again, almost over 800,000 folks heard it on almost 200 um, runs and spots that were hosted. And then this is really just a summary of everything I just talked about, but um, when they ran, what the actual cost was of each, the estimated impressions, and then the actual impressions that we got, how many people actually saw it. And so we really were happy with the fact that we we got two million more impressions than we thought we would get out of the media by itself. So many more people um, are seeing and hearing uh, the message that are out there. And I will say, um, as Michelle said, we have a significantly larger population of this some college, no degree, um, you know, uh, subset here in Northeast Ohio. Um, and we are targeting particular um, zip codes within the city, actually, that, that have, um, that meet that criteria. And so we're really happy with, um, with how this is going and, and who's seeing the ads. So finally, um, the sort of by the numbers where we are on some of the outcomes. We have been working with 675 um, residents in the city of Cleveland since October 1st to help them figure out what re-enrollment you know, might work best for them. Um, and 62 of them are uh, comebackers. Uh, 13 have actually taken, had sort of previous debts that we've been able to pay off for a total of $12,800. And you heard Michelle talk about that, that debt forgiveness money that we have from the county. So we're excited about that. Um, and then we do enjoy these really nice partnerships, as she said, with Cleveland State and Tri-C, um, where College Now actually serves um, as an outreach partner for them. They give us lists of stopped out students and College Now provides um, outreach and calling and texting to those stopped out students. And so we've contacted, you can see there, uh, 2,300 2, students um, from both of those institutions to try and um, get them to re-enroll. So those are, those are really nice partnerships. And that's what the data looks like. And I'm gonna let Michelle just wrap us up and talk about a little bit more grassroots work that uh, College Now does. Yep, so part of the campaign was really to partner with grassroots community organizations where residents live, work, and play. One that we're particularly proud of is that we recently opened a site at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank where we have staff there at least two days a week and on the weekends serving families. Um, we also have a resource center downtown in Tower City. We also have our adult program staff. They are everywhere adults are, so we're really not you know, sitting passively waiting for people to come speak to us. We try to get out in the community. 
That's the Greater Cleveland Food Bank and other partners. If you go to the next slide, you will see all of our partners we're working with in the city of Cleveland, just to give you a sense of who, we are, who we're working with to try to encourage more comebackers to come back. I won't go over the list. No, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I think lastly what we wanted to share is that we are very excited and would like to continue providing information that you can put in your newsletters. Um, it's ongoing. Our chief marketing officer, she works with not only the city, but the school district and other partners to try to get the message out so that we can reach more people. And we wanted to give a particular shout out to Councilman McCormick. We were in his 2023-2024 newsletter. And here's just a picture of kind of what the advertisement was. So what's next in our campaign? Launching organic paid social media for our cafe video. We're going to pur purchase additional spots with updated creativity in FY25. We're going to continue measuring our targeted campaign effectiveness, and we're going to continue to develop grassroots, a grassroots campaign and continue to outreach. So just doing more of what we're doing, bringing on more partners, and just trying to, to reach more adult learners, comebackers. And that's all we have, so I think we can take Thank questions. You. <clears throat> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. I didn't realize Facebook and Instagram was so expensive <laughs> with their advertising. They are. Um, and that's targeting, like, just when it, like, targets certain areas and it just keeps resharing. Yes. That's what you're paying for, right? Yes. So that sponsored, that little sponsored thing you see in your Facebook feed. Right. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's what it is. So, um, thank you. This is great. I mean, is it fair to say that? the $300,000 is spent. We will spend it all the way out, but yes. we think we're so, going to get a good return on that investment. Well, we know we will. We are. So, Madam Chair, we allocated $100,000 each year, and we've spent $100,000 this year, yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, I'm sure my colleagues are going to have more um, better questions, and I'm sure they're going to talk about the sustainability and leveraging those dollars. So um, I will open it up to Spencer, Councilwoman Spencer. And can you take over really Yes, quick? I can. <laughs> <laughs> and apologies, everybody. We, have various members of the committee, have had to step away from the table at various points for okay. things that are happening in our, in our wards today. But... Um, and I apologize, I missed the beginning of this presentation, but uh, in effect, it's, it seems like that the, the, the dollars are on, on pace to be spent and, and there's a plan for the remaining 200,000. Yes, um, Councilwoman, um, they are, so this year's dollars, we sort of equally allocated the, the $300,000 over each year and, um, we um, did, the vast majority of the dollars are going to the media buy um, to make sure that those dollars, you know, that that's reaching as many folks as we possibly can. And um, we, I don't know if you caught, we are reaching um, thousands and thousands of folks with those media buys, which we're very happy about. And we're working with over um, 600 residents right now um, of the city of Cleveland uh, in their sort of re-enrollment process, um, which we're very happy with as a result. Thank you. And in, yes. ca in case I did miss it, my only other question would be, let's say an individual sees the ad or gets connected in some in some way mm -hmm. what would be the step they would take or how would they take it how what, what would be the entry point what does that look and feel like to enter begin the process enter mm -hmm. the process yes so there are um councilwoman spencer thank you for that question um there are multiple ways um again if they connect through the campaign some way online um or actually hear a radio spot or something like that, they can call um, the College Now number, 216-241-5587 for those. Um, we would love that and can set up an appointment in the Resource mm -hmm. Center anytime. Um, we also offer virtual appointments as well, so you don't have to physically come to meet with us. Exactly. Um, there is help available all the time. Um, but 
folks can come in and really sit down with an advisor that will help them look at what the right fit is, what they're looking, if they need FAFSA help, if they're just looking for sort of a career inventory, interest inventory, and what programs might be of interest to them, and sort of really advisors um, in the Resource Center meet them exactly where they are and what they might need and be looking for. Okay. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Councilman Trey. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, uh, this is amazing um, presentation. As I have to echo uh, Councilman Jones, <laughs> it's like kind of speechless here. Uh, so thorough. Uh, but I do have a couple of questions on this. Um, when you go back, when you said that um, you have actors to um, you pay actors mm. chair to the uh, committee you say you pay actors to do the uh, videos slash podcasts mm -hmm. um, I know that's how sometime um, uh, uh, organization starts off to uh, to uh, um, let people know what the organization mm -hmm. is getting ready to do mm -hmm. so to this point um, to this point chair to the panel to the committee since you have already reached out to over 600 um, residents mm -hmm. and you have, uh, you said 13 Cleveland residents have taken advantage of the, uh, for the, what the Cocoa, the DAT repayment program. Mm -hmm. However, then you have um, the comeback students who have came back and in the program, I know where she's Instead going. of pan actors, mm -hmm. yes, can they now mm -hmm. absolutely uh, do mm -hmm. the podcast mm -hmm. where this will save money mm -hmm. for you to continue to do what is needed for the offer money that we have given you? Mm -hmm. So if I could take this chair one. to I'm one. sorry, okay. chair oh, to the president chair to now, the president. Uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so absolutely, we just completed, I think you heard Autumn earlier, that's our partner, so mm -hmm. shout out to Autumn. Um, you heard her talk about they just finished their strategic plan. Well, we did too, and what came from our community was mm -hmm. that we don't do enough to promote all the services that are available. Mm -hmm. So I anticipate with um, some other dollars that we're going to be leveraging, our marketing campaigning uh, efforts will explode. And to your point, we will definitely seek to have testimonials, you know, folks coming in, you know, doing TikToks for us. Mm -hmm. All the things that those who are mostly impacted by our work, they can communicate a lot better, you know, what, what the impact was of what we've done. Yes perhaps a little bit more than a paid actor. So like you said, this was an effort to get it off the ground. Yeah. And as we continue to have success stories, we're definitely gonna be tapping those folks to come back into the community, mm -hmm. to come with us to talk about the program. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we hire folks, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. We hire folks who wanna give back because this has helped them so much. Mm -hmm. So absolutely point well taken. We will look to include more of our actual students yes. in our promotional and marketing materials. Oh, definitely, yes. I think that that is a great, answer and I and that is a great uh, um, um, this is how you collaborate that someone that's going come back into the system to get their degree they probably are in this field to uh, you know uh, you know to um, to exploit that as well yeah mm -hmm. uh, per se mm -hmm. so in the second only the second and final question is um, um, the funding that uh, that you have left could you just go in a little detail what that funding is for? So I'll let Maggie take Other it. I'm sure it's maybe to replicate. What but you spent it on, what mm -hmm. is the actual funding is for, for the beneficial of the comeback students? Yep. Chair to, Madam Chair to the panel. Sure, mm -hmm. through the chair um, to the councilwoman. Mm -hmm. Are you referring to uh, the money rest, that's left? The, the 200,000. The 200,000 200, yes. that's left. Yes. Correct. Yes. It will um, very much mirror the media buy okay. that has been done. Um, although we, we may adjust a little bit um, and, you know, do more social media if that seems, because that does seem to be our most effective um, <clears throat> Uh, views and um, sort of outreach, um, but it will largely go to the the media buy um, aspect, and then the firm that is 
that we consulted with Singleton and Partners does have oh, okay. the sort of additional um, amount of Oh, the, for that. Because here you have one more question. Yep. Are you saying that because Chair to uh, the committee said that you was able to pay 13 students debt off? So will that also incumbent that if more students that to be paid? I'm just this is a positive. I'm yes. Not saying it's a negative. No, I know. Right. Correct. Would that still be uh, something that you're able to help to come back students with, and yes. other than just putting all in media? Yes. Because I'm not really. So uh, through the chair to the councilwoman, that thirteen thousand dollars is actually in a separate fund that a we have. Fund. Yes, that we are leveraging. Okay. So we are using these dollars solely for communication purposes, and we oh. have those comebacker funds we have a million is a separate, is a separate yes. fund okay. that we are okay using. so that's what the funding was for for media purposes. correct correct okay. yes yep. all right just Thank promoting you. the just promoting <laughs> what you're doing at yes. college now yes. and connecting them to all the other resources and dollars the comebacker funds that are available okay. right, all right. Yes. Well, i'm gonna come and do a tour i, I know i said i was last year but i scheduled that's get okay. really overwhelming be but I, busy but i want to come and do it it would be but great you're right here on the um on a community college? Our resource center is right in Tower City. In Tower City. But right. we have offices in every Cleveland school, high school. We mm -hmm. have an office at the Cleveland Food Bank, and we could just meet you wherever you'd like to meet. Okay, okay, so you up on the top floor and still in Tower City. Actually, we're just, now in the old post office building, which is connected to Tower City. So the old post office plaza building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can get to us through Tower City, though. Okay, all right, do I need an appointment or just can I pop in? I want you to call. Me. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a, a grand tour. <laughs> okay, can I, you have a card? I'm going to give you my phone. Can I give it to you right yes, now? Is that mm -hmm. okay? 216 926 4518. All right. Yes, 216-926-4518. Okay, and your entire name? Michelle Scott Taylor. Okay. Through the chair, that's 1L in Michelle. Okay. <laughs> As it should be. Okay. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. That's it. It's all for me, Chair. We're good? All right. Okay. Councilman Jones, you're on the list. Thank you, Madam Wrap Chairwoman. Wrap us up and get us out of here by five. <laughs> Come on. Well, you just be treating me bad. <laughs> Madam Chairwoman, you know I must love you. You're always cutting me short. Um, I may not need it, but I may need it. Just depends on how um, the questions go. Um, Madam Chairwoman, to uh, Mrs. Taylor, you run this program, correct? Let me be clear. I oversee the programs that we offer that provides the service. This project is more of a marketing project, so I don't oversee the marketing project. What I oversee is the work that comes from our outreach efforts to residents. Who, who runs the marketing part of this? We have a chief marketing officer. Her name is Allison Bibb Carson. But you oversee her? We're peers. We're colleagues. I see. Yep. What's her name? Allison Bibb Carson. Mm -hmm. Okay. But Maggie worked last year to with Allison and myself and others to get the funding. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and this is a part of the $300,000 that the Cleveland City Council had given you to market to get older people back in school. Is that correct, Madam correct. Chairwoman, to Ms. Oh, Taylor? Sorry. Through the chair to the councilmen. More specifically, our target was those who had some college and no degree, because theoretically they're lower hanging fruit, you would, you would think, because they went off to college at some point and just needed an opportunity to try to get back in. Right. And so if you could help me just understand these numbers real quick, because it may be, you know, the, the fastest way. You made a presentation and you have uh, where it says media spend, okay. Facebook, Instagram, display, display video, and radio. Okay. And, um, and you have in those categories uh, when the, the program started in terms of the media proposition from what time to what time. And then you also have what it costs you on the budget, which gives us a grand total of $68,000. Then you have estimated impressions and impressions delivered. Uh, can you explain to me uh, what estimated impressions are and what 
the difference between estimated impressions and impressions delivered. Sure. Through the chair to the councilman, um, estimated impressions are the, uh, the marketing firm's best guess at how many folks will actually see the ads so that's on estimate. those plans. That's an okay. estimate. And then actual impressions are the, the actual bolded impressions delivered, how many actually saw the ads. Okay. Yes. And so then out of this, how do you get to the comeback community relations by the numbers? Is the 675 is directly from these impressions, um, the residents that uh, uh, saw these impressions? And if so, how, did, how were you able to determine that the 675 that we have here uh, is a part of that? Through the chair to the councilman, we, um, so College Now uh, has, when they, uh, when someone clicks on one of the ads, it takes them to the College Now website, and they can schedule appointments and things like that, and they have to do something called an intake form, which just asks you your name and your phone number and your reason for scheduling an appointment. And so... Um, that's the, that's, that's the, the sort of con so, connector, if you will. Okay. Um, so it Got tells it. us, yeah. Got it. So then the 675 Cleveland residents that have worked with one on one since October 1st, did we do anything with them? Yes, those are all the individuals that are being served. So when you said being served, they're actually back in school now? They are not in school. They are receiving some type of service or, um, you know, FAFSA help or advising. Is or there a breakdown of the number that can help me to really uh, quantify what's ha actually happening with the number? I think we We have it. that. Yes, yes, we can follow up with that information. So do we know how many of the 675, Madam Chairwoman, are actually in college now because of the promotions of 68,000 invested? Um, yes, <laughs> Madam Chair, to the Councilman, uh, we, we do. Um, we will have to follow up with that. That's the, the by the numbers. See, those are the numbers, Madam Chairwoman, we'd like to see. Yes. Uh, we'd like to see production, right? Because I'm not opposed to the $300,000 invested, mm -hmm. but I, I would like to know that, you know, the monies that we're investing here at the table mm -hmm. can quantify into something that I can touch, feel, and see. Mm -hmm. And so if you say that you have over 7 million impressions and we've only got 675 out of that that actually hit your web page, and then of that 675, we don't know yet, or we can't determine, or you can't give me the information. It leaves it open in my mind. Mm -hmm. And so to close that with these types of presentations is to say, this is what has happened, boom, 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 if that makes sense, Madam Chairwoman. Mm -hmm. to Madam the President. Chair, yes, Madam Chair, through the chair to the council person, I, I think I want to be a little bit more specific. When we say 665 Cleveland residents, 675 75 re Chairman. Cleveland residents we've worked with in one on one, that means we are working with them to do the steps for them to re enroll. Now, many more people have clicked on the site. Many more people are now exposed to what College Now offers. Many people might have received a flyer. Many people might have, you know, went on our scholarship database because perhaps you did not need one-on-one -on -one support. So this is, this is the most impactful number because this is the, these are the groups of people who we are trying to actually re-enroll them in college. To your, to your question about what do the numbers suggest. So 675, we are actively working with them to re-enroll. There are many more folks who probably have had a service with us, but this is our most intensive, um, our most intensive work that we do, one-on-ones mm -hmm. with individuals. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yes. Okay. And, and so, but you'll get the breakdown and let me know what those results are. And Very the results you're looking to know specifically, because I think I'm, I just want to make sure we're clear, you want to know how many Cleveland residents who are comebackers ultimately enroll in post-secondary. Correct, sir? Correct. Okay. You know, because you may have a breakdown. You may have those that are, you've helped, 
yep. um, uh, and they haven't done anything, or, and then there are those who are in the Absolutely. process, mm -hmm. um, but, or they may be still undetermined, and then you have those who are actually r enrolled. Correct. This has had a altering change in their life and is making a difference. Mm -hmm. We can do um, that. Uh, the debt payment uh, issue, I guess that speaks for itself. Now, explain to me how, uh, so there is a debt repayment program and where people owe money uh, and they're able to get into a program to pay that off with previous, uh, can you explain it. that? Maggie, I'll let Madam oh. Chairwoman. Yes. To Mrs. Margaret, I'm yes. sorry, Ms. Margaret, what's your last name? McGrath. McGrath? Yes. Oh, that's a nice name. <laughs> Thank uh, I you. like McGrath. Uh, <laughs> it reminds me of Commander Mike McGrath. Yes. Is, are you He's related? He's a fine gentleman. I am not. Okay, well, that's <laughs> yes. all right. You, you're I on a good be, note already. I would be honored already. to be related. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're on a good note with me. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, through the chair to the councilman, um, yes, uh, it is a program for debt forgiveness uh, that Cleveland State and Tri-C both run, and we are trying to leverage again with these dollars. Um, we were given a million dollars, actually, by the county, um, also in ARPA funds, um, again, separately, to use um, and promote. So if students have previous debts and wish to re-enroll, they can um, do that, and we will forgive their their previous debts. Oh, so you can forgive them yes. just yes. like that. Yes. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. All right. It's so very then, helpful. Yes, it is. So um, I didn't know that. So these dollars are helping sort of bring in and use those those uh, those additional funds. I want to give you my card um, so you can tell me a little bit more about that, how it works. Yes. Um, because we that don't have be the lovely. time. And I know Madam Chairwoman has been so patient. The committee has been patient. I want to wear them out on the last group that's here. So, uh, Madam Chairwoman, um, that would like to know uh, the 248 outreach, what does that mean? Is that students who have withdrawn from uh, Cleveland State University students mm -hmm. and, and we're just targeting them to bring them back? I presume that's what that means? Yes, so through the chair to the councilman, um, at Cleveland State, at Cleveland State and Tri-C both uh, give college now uh, lists of students that have stopped out over the last couple of years, and College Now does the outreach to try and re-enroll those students. Well, Madam Chairwoman, I don't uh, have any further questions. I want to try to get out here. I'm sorry, I went over. I tried to make it uh, quicker, but uh, I really appreciate your leadership uh, as the Chairwoman of this committee. And, um, and I appreciate the presenters that were here today, and thank you for the work that you do for our citizens. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, thank you for being mindful. I'm like a minute away from hungry. So <laughs> I don't know if you know a woman that's hungry. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but thank you for thank your you. time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Michelle Chief, for um, just sticking throughout the, this whole meeting. Thank you for all the great work that you do and to my colleagues for the great questions that mm. you guys asked yeah, and for you. sticking around. Yes. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Go ahead. Can I add to our speakers at the table, thank you for your patience and being the last speakers. We know that that can be a lot. So yes. But great yes. job, Madam Chair. No, thank you yes. so thank much. You. Important conversation. For filling in when I had to take a break. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Don't you love the women like love around this table? <laughs> you feel it? Is it Phil and Joe? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, workforce Education and Youth Development adjourned. Thank you.